also, uh, Laura, let people know, will you? What? I'm I'm live now, so um, if you want to do Facebook and all that kind of stuff, let people know. Yeah, mine, Tennessee's bees, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, hello, and if you're watching this down the road, um, no one's shown up yet, but maybe I didn't hit the right button. Let's see. Now, we didn't announce this either. I've had a couple people ask if there would be a live chat. Oh, I see a, a person show up. So we're mainly talking about fall splits, fall flow, all kinds of different things. We're starting to see the beginning of the end of summer dearth here, and that's a super exciting time. The bees respond very well to a decent fall flow, and there's a lot of factors that go into nature providing a decent fall flow. Hey, Bee Lord, on the other side of the planet, how, how are you guys doing over there? Starting to get your fall weather going. Hey, everybody. Good to see you guys. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, this is actually how I do my hair a lot when I'm not in the bee yard. Um, I had someone tease me uh, in Kentucky last week that I looked like I was right out of the 50s. But, you know, what I said, classy is always in style. And, you know, it is. You know, these days, it's just whatever, you know. So, I don't know. I like stuff from the 50s. That's why actually we named my son Jimmy and, and Kathleen Kathleen because I I like classy things myself. I think I was born old. I like older trucks. I like, you know, my, my hero's always been my, my grandpa. Um, he's not with us anymore, but he was a really cool guy. And uh, definitely my personality comes a lot from him. Now, he was not a beekeeper by any stretch. Peaky blinders haircut. <laughs> I haven't seen that, but I, I've seen some pictures. You know, actually, the, the can that I use is Dapper Dan. So any of you who've seen Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, the movie, has some great music. It's pretty stupid, um, but for the, the time period and the hairstyles, um, that is, I actually did use Dapper Dan for my hair. So getting into bee stuff. Lebanon, Tennessee. All right. I'm, so I'm actually getting some of my chicken feed from there. What's the best mite treatment? Tim Tice uh, or whatever asks. So it depends on your definition. If you're wanting all natural stuff, then I would go with Apigard. Um, it's a thymol product. It's not quite as good, in my opinion, as Apivar as far as killing mites, but Apivar is a synthetic albeit it is one of the more cleaner synthetics. A lot of people still have issues, but the more research that we've so far done into um, the active ingredient, it breaks down very quick, um, supposedly. Um, it oxidizes, but if you're going for the more all-natural approach, then Apigard, thymol product. I'm not a fan of formic acid at all. I'm not going to probably change my mind anytime soon, though I Hope to experiment more with it in the future because a lot of people really like the thoughts of using it. Um, but I like those two products. Actually, um, I use both of those products. Um, I treat multiple times a year, and I like to switch things up. Don't let those mites get immune to anything. We like to hit them with the left and the right. Yeah, I really like a brother where art thou. Some of my best friends and I, um, well, one of my best friends actually gave me the Dapper Dan can, and the music is absolutely great. I, I love some of the musicians that play in that show. Hey, from Detroit, Michigan, Indiana. All right, I've been up in like all of those places. Now, I haven't been in Melbourne, Australia, or Poland. Oh, is it? Oh, okay, it's shining on the camera. It's a blue light special. All right, there we go. My little blue icon. All right. Yeah, we've been getting good rains and stuff. It's been really awesome. Summer has been like the opposite of spring. Spring was rough. Summer, this has been the nicest summer that we've had in several years. We're getting rains periodically. It's not getting blistering hot for weeks on end and drying out. We're getting more trickles of pollen, and we've even had some good days of pollen. And 
between that and our supplemental feeding, the beasts just look really good going into fall and everything's really green and lush. So as long as there's not any crazy weather during peak bloom or anything like that, we're probably going to have a decent fall flow. I'm not looking to pull any honey. We just look to have our bees healthy. So when they go into winter, they're really healthy. Thailand and Canada. Hey, everybody. So um, where can one get carny queens? Now, there's a lot of places to get carny queens, uh, Carl. I got my 40 from Michael Palmer in Vermont. They're very hard to get because Michael's hard to get a hold of. However, a lot of people know that I'm hard to get a, a hold of as well. And that's by design. I just don't have a lot of time. And I know Michael doesn't either, especially for phone calls and, and people showing up without an invite. But uh, I always tell Michael if he ever has, um, you know, 30 or 40 extra, send them my way. And um, he must have had some extra. So he, he, but the thing of it is, he, it's like, I don't hear from him for like seven or eight months. And I'm like, all right, well, it looks like I'm not getting any queens. And then it's always like I have something crazy going on. And then Michael's like, hey, Cayman, got some queens. Um, if you want them, I'll ship them out to you tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I can't handle this right now. But um, you got to get it while the getting's good. So we made it happen. So Ron asked, do you pull honey supers going into fall? I pull our honey supers in June. Now, this year I had some still on in early July. But typically I pull all of our honey supers in June. This year was a little bit odd, but I like to get all the honey supers off, apply those treatments, always stay ahead of the Varroa um, game that we're constantly playing. And our bees look really good because of that. I don't, again, I don't worry about pulling fall honey. It's not the greatest tasting in the world, I, I don't think. And I really like seeing my bees go through winter on goldenrod and wing stem and all those natural pollens and as long as the mite levels are low and they've got a good queen, they do really good. And some of my bee yards last year, even the fall wasn't that great last year, overwintered 100% on natural resources. Now, I had some hives that I had to feed, especially late splits. They all have to be fed. There's no question. What's your favorite YouTube bee person besides yourself? I like a couple of people on YouTube. I really like Ian Stepler, um, just as a person in, in general, as busy as he is, and also as different as his beekeeping um, practices are, I really feel like he's just genuinely a nice guy. Um, now, some people might think I'm a genuinely nice guy too. Um, I'm sure we all have our days. <laughs> I, 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 I know I do. Um, but at the same, Laurel's shaking her head. Yes, yes amen preach it and uh anyways so but ian is really uh, just down to earth humble guy especially for as good as his system's going i like richard noel and there's there's several others that are um doing several good things on youtube as well but i, I really like ian just as as a person and as a youtube channel um even though our climates are totally different i'll never be able to produce honey like ian does uh his information is very practical and fundamental, and that's that's super important. There's an old saying I was thinking about earlier today as I was working bees. I just went through I went through about sixty something colonies here at the house, and beekeeping. The old saying is beekeeping is fifty percent um, art and fifty percent what is it fundamental or experience? Basically, something along those lines. So, basically, fifty percent art form, fifty percent skill, all that kind of stuff. And I, I got to thinking. I really think it's less of an art than we give it credit for. And I think most of the time we read these books or we, we say stuff like that because either we don't know or we like to make ourselves sound more cool than we really are. But there is an art to this. Don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of science to it. And the more and more I look into the science and the, the fundamentals and just understanding stuff that I didn't know years ago, the more it makes sense to me. And it, there's, there's not as many qu big questions uh, looming out there. And we hope that our channel um, helps point you in the right direction on what will work for you guys as well. Hey, Brian, gee whiz, man. You're, I appreciate that. You're too much. Um, thank you for what you do for our channel. We appreciate you, man. Um, ask some questions. 
So, hey, oh, yeah, uh, Patrick Turner was mentioned Bob Benny, and I, I keep forgetting about Bob. Um, I, I don't know Bob personally, but just watching um, a couple of his videos, a couple of our subscribers um, eight months ago pointed him out to me, and I watched a few of his stuff, and you could just tell this guy ain't messing around. <laughs> he, he's done this a couple times. Um, Bob, Bob Benny seems very down to earth. You can tell he knows stuff. I like Bob Benny's channel. If you haven't subscribed to him, do it. We're not here to monopolize the beekeeping YouTube industry. Uh, we're here to help point you in the right direction, whether that's uh, with Bob's channel or Ian's channel or ours or Richard Noel's or whoever. Um, I really think all those guys have a lot of good information, and we try to keep up. Oh, yeah, the carny bees. I, see, sorry, guys. My mind just goes all over the place a very scattered brained so I've, I've purchased carnies literally across the united states uh, from michael palmer in vermont i've purchased a couple local ones some that are half and half supposedly i purchased some from um strakens or how you pronounce that um conan's out in california some out of georgia all kinds of different things and you know what i found is I don't like buying queens. I absolutely hate it. It's one of my top hate things in beekeeping, right up there with painting boxes, varroa mites, and putting in wax foundation in large quantities. I The only time I've ever been satisfied with some carnies that I've purchased is when I purchased from Michael Palmer. That's, that's why I'm buying from him again. I don't think necessarily it's because the genetics are bad from these people. It's just these, these huge operations are just doing tens and hundreds of thousands, and they, they don't give them enough chance to lay. There's a lot of different things that happen, and um, it's just really hit and miss. I remember, I think I've said this before on here, I ordered 100 queens one time from a commercial operation, and about 30% of them were just worthless right out of the gate. And then about 30-odd percent of them were kind of you know good, but they weren't anything like what I can raise myself. And then about you know about thirty percent, forty percent were kind of like what I would expect to see if I raised my own queens. And I just feel like it's a it's a quality control issue. Um, I wish I could give you guys um, better resources for purchasing queens, but I have purchased from probably twenty different individuals or more since I got into beekeeping. And Michael Palmer is the only one that I can think of that I would say. I would like those queens again. It's frustrating. It's very hard as a beginner beekeeper because you can't control that side of the game. And if you have a mediocre or poor queen, it makes it very hard to get comb drawn, honey produced, make splits. It makes it hard to do everything. Yeah, and um, one, of the, one of the guys commented up here about the... Um, you know, there's there's two guys in Canada. We got one of them on here. Um, you know, not Ian Stepler, but there's another guy. Um, the small, I think a small Canadian beekeeper, and he has a YouTube channel as well. And you know, for those of you who are far up north, those kind of channels, um, troubleshooting that kind of stuff are really handy. Yeah, and you know, just um, yeah, how much does a queen cost? Oh goodness, that that really varies. I mean, good you you can get a cheap commercial queen from Georgia right now for nineteen or twenty bucks if you're buying them, uh, you know, ten or fifteen, twenty at a time, depending on the time of the year from those suppliers. And then you get some of these hippy dippy special um, magic bees that are immune to everything, and you know they're forty or fifty dollars. And then hey, you can blow a thousand dollars on a breeder queen, no problem. So. Do you use a queen excluder on new hives when you add your first super and all you have is new foundation and frames in the super? My bees seem to not want to cross the queen excluder. Um, hey, ECP, I never add a queen excluder until they have committed to drawing comb in that second box. Um, I don't care if she lays a little bit in there. I prefer that she didn't, but sometimes it takes getting the queen up there and them drawing a little bit of comb in her lane. Once they commit to her laying up there they're a lot better about drawing that out but sometimes you put that queen excluder on they won't move up because it's foundation and that queen excluder just they don't see that as storage space and their space really and they'll backfill that bottom nest and they're going to swarm on you so um, definitely watch that i do love queen excluders the longer i use them the more that i love them it allows me to keep more bees it helps me to be less 
stressful to the colonies because I'm not spending as much time because I know where everything is for the most part. If I need to pull some honey from some colonies to give to a colony that's light, it's above the excluder. If I need some bee bread, it's going to be mostly below. If I need some brood to make splits, if I need to find the queen, if I need to do mite treatments, it's more effective because it's more concentrated, all that kind of stuff. All right. Do, 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 do. I missed something. Hey, Chip. Good to see you on here again, and thanks um, very much. Um, if you have any questions, guys, um, ask away. We appreciate you very much. And again, um, you know about the Georgia queens. I, I know some guys who raise their own queens down in Georgia, and the, you know they seem to have a really good, successful operation. Well, Bob Benny's out of Georgia, um, and he raises his own queens and stuff like that. So I really feel like it's not the location as much as it is quality. There's some folks that talk about how, ex you know, you shouldn't be purchasing queens in Vermont if you're in Tennessee and vice versa. And I think there is something to that, especially if it's extreme. You know, going through winters up there is totally different than down here. But honestly, I think the biggest deal is queen quality. Genetics are important, but I feel like we have more of a quality problem than a genetic problem. We're just some bad queens going out but think about it there's so much demand for them right now it doesn't matter if the quality is good people still buy them anyways and a lot of that's because of the whole ccd scare you know the news loves that scares and um you know that got blown out of proportion and more hobbyists than ever got into beekeeping and that's why a lot of us are here so it's not all bad but at the same time it created a huge demand for bees and bee equipment prices on everything went crazy and right now the demand for queens is way higher than the supply and because of that crap can be sold without a whole lot of consequences which is it's a shame is garlic bread tasty absolutely so how are your hive beetles they've really picked up um, they have but my bees are you know, pretty healthy and strong if they're not then we get rid of them Yes, yeah, Dan, I, I saw that about the thousand dollar or whatever it was, Caucasians from from Cali. I, I'm interested to see how those go. Um, I've always been curious to try them, but a thousand dollars, you know, eh. you, you can get some, um, I think, second generation quite a bit cheaper. But honestly, I, I really like the bees that we have here. And I bring in some of Michael's because I feel like he actually does a really good job. And it's always with bees good to have genetic diversity. Johnny um, asked, do you like single brood management boxes? I absolutely love it. Now, you still have to do work to those. You got to make sure they don't get plugged up. Everything's easier when you have drawn comb, but even if you have drawn supers to put on them, they'll still want to swarm at certain times of the year, so you need to pull bees out of them. And I'm not all about honey like a lot of folks are. I'm about you know nukes, queens, and honey. So I would prefer to split my bees a little bit too much and eliminate almost all swarming tendency, get a split out of it, then go for the biggest honey crop possible and risk some potential swarming. So that's just the way that I look at We're going to try to do more videos on that um, spring of next year. This, this year, because of how poor the honey flow was, it really just swarming wasn't that bad here. I mean, honestly, this is the easiest swarm year ever, but because of that honey production was down around 40 50 percent lower than i would have really liked to have seen it this year probably about 40 percent um still we did all right um we definitely didn't do what i wanted hey jeff um i was talking to one of the guys at healthy bees about the essential oils because essential oils has been pretty popular the last decade and even before that but especially the last decade and we really don't know enough about it what i do know about essential oils is that it, it can be really disruptive to the colony and i think that they have their place but i don't think we understand the concentration game enough and definitely i, I use patties to beef bees up and especially coming out of winter if you're throwing on some patties and it has a little bit of a something that's going to slow brood rearing down, that's kind of counterproductive. Um, now, again, getting back to what he said, they are actually making some up with little to no essential oil in them and seeing how that works because um, he feels like there's a little bit too much in there as well. 
I don't know what all is going on, but if they, they say that they might actually send me some if they have extra that don't have any essential oil in them at all, and we'll see how that works. And that's, again, why when we try new products out, I, I definitely want – it would be best maybe sometimes if everyone gives us a chance to try them. I'm not saying trust us entirely because you know we don't – we don't, we're not super sciencey about all this stuff. I like using sciencey. It's really a smart word. And because it can take us a while to figure stuff out too. I definitely couldn't pick up on things in the first couple of weeks with them. It, after two months, I was able to get an idea and there's just so many factors, but all of these new gadgets that come into the beekeeping world and supplements really need to be tested. It was just like oxalic acid vapor. I keep going back to this, but when it came over, um, we finally got it legalized and I say came over a lot of the techniques from europe and stuff everyone's like oh man this is the best thing ever it's going to take care of everything and it has serious limitations as well the rumor wagon can get started quickly and a lot of people end up buying stuff that does they don't need or they don't know how to use the tool correctly and i really think the uh, you have to watch the essential oils hey russell thanks man um I'm not sure I've seen you on here before, um, but then again, there's a lot of people that come on here periodically, but I really appreciate you, and um, if you have any questions, um, drop it. So Chip was like, uh, where was that, Chip? Uh, I see a lot of Apivar strips in your videos. How do you decide when you're going to use Apivar versus other methods? Well, um, Chip, I, I believe in hammering those mites all the way to the, the doors of hell, and I I like using multiple techniques, as I've said before. So in wintertime, I want a couple of rounds of oxalic acid vapor. And then right after we pull supers, we are either going to do Apivar or Apigard. In the past, we typically lean heavily on Thymol. This year, I've been so busy and you know, starting to go back to work a little bit more. So just to keep things simple this year, we threw strips in, and we're, we're doing some Apigard. Um, here in the next, after we pull the strips out, we're going to go through colonies and do alcohol washes, and we're going to run some Apigard in there as well. One of the nice things about Apigard is because it's a thymol product, any tracheal mites or anything like that that are sensitive to thymol and menthol will also be eliminated using that product along with some varroa mites. So I like using that as well because even if the tracheal mite populations are fairly low, um, or even, you know, some of the colonies, they might be a little bit higher in, and I don't know. It's hard to test for that without a lot of work, and I just don't take the time for it. So I throw those on there because I can kill Varroa and some Tracheal at the same time. But I'm really, really hoping, and things are looking very well towards next year of having no job and being able to spend more time on, on some things. I would really like to do some very thorough tests on Apigard, because we all want something that's going to work and give us the results that we want that's not a synthetic miticide like Apifar is. So um, stay tuned for that. And hey, Christina, thanks so much. Um, and you're very welcome. I hope our stuff helps you out. So Stan says, you mentioned you might buy some pre-made patties next year. What would you buy? Well, right now, Ultra B patties, just because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, also, I've got a good relationship with um, the girls up at Kelly's and, and the management there, and it's close to me, so I can save on freight. I usually drive up there once or twice a year anyways for bulk buys, and so that that's the low-hanging fruit, but I am also looking at global patties as well. I have some friends who are commercial beekeepers that say the consumption rate is much higher on those. I don't know that personally. I've heard a lot of things over the years, and a lot of it has been bull. So I do trust these guys pretty well, though. Do you have an opinion of the lay-ins hive for a guy with no beekeeping experience? Um, I do. And I think that they can be a great hive for the bees and the beekeeper. However, they're, Langstroth, since it is so commonly used, it's easier to source. It's easier to get equipment quicker but if you're wanting to build it yourself and you have the, the tools and uh, the time to do that then that's great i really look at it like this if the there's a great queen in there there's dead mice and there's good nutrition you guys knew that was coming right um they're going to do great in anything they can be in a tire and, and do pretty well 
I know a lot of beekeepers in my state of Tennessee, they have open mesh floors the entire winter here. Now we're pretty mild. We still get, you know, in the teens and sometimes even the single digits for a few days, but not a whole lot. And I think the, the lay-ins is good. I think we need to look more into insulated hives, but are they necessary? No. Maybe they're just more inefficient with their foodstuffs, but I really like Langstroth equipment just because bees do great in it as long as they have those three keys, but there's nothing wrong with the lands. I love, I love different types of equipment. It's just a matter of personal preference for you. The, really, the equipment is made for the beekeeper more than the bees. And, but again, I think we should look into uh, insulated beehives, maybe a little bit more thicker wood, stuff like that. It gets a little more complicated when you get on the business side of things because everything's expensive, um, at, you know, at a small scale. And, but if you're buying a lot and then they end up like, oh man, this didn't work out for me, then you just have a bunch of money sitting there. And in the state of Tennessee, if it's been used, it's illegal to sell unless it has live bees in it and it's been inspected. Hey, Ray, I'm um, good to see you on here. Hope everything's d doing good in the New England state uh, and all that kind of stuff. I know things are pretty crazy, but um, hope uh, hope things are doing well. And I I've seen you recommend us several times on different platforms, Ray, and I appreciate that very much. So entering fall, when do you use oxalic acid? I'm in North GA, so weather similar to yours, Phil. So oxalic acid can be used pretty much any time of the year except when honey supers are on the colony. So as long as those are off, you're good to go. The main thing is just ensuring that you either have it, uh, apply it enough that you're covering the brood cycle, because in my personal opinion, and people like Michael Palmer, Jennifer Berry, PhD down um, in Georgia, um, I think it's Georgia, it's just, just so many PhDs in so many places, but um, you know, Randy Oliver starting to say it now, um, other people like that. It is not a long-term kill as most of us were led to believe early on. And that's just because we didn't have good data. And I don't think we had as, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have the platforms like we do now. And so things just didn't spread. It's not that effective for a long-term kill. So if you're going to be covering a heavy brood rearing colony the whole period, you're probably going to have to do at least five rounds in a 21, 24 day period. And then I still personally, I would do an alcohol wash and then check and see where we're at because um, it's just not that lethal when there's a lot of brood in the hive. I'm not a huge fan of doing it that way. Someone said the volume's a little bit low. Is, is anyone else having a hard time hearing? I, I'm, I know I'm going in and out on the mic. I'm getting closer, getting back. Yeah, I really like the bulk Apa guard as well. That's what we buy and we, you know, we chuck a little bit on. But we usually do the um, 33 grams per application instead of doing two rounds of 50 doing three rounds of 33 I, I feel like it's a little bit less disruptive to the bees because thymol is disruptive to the colony you have to watch it it's a little temperature sensitive another reason why apifar is better in that regard it, it you know, doesn't really if you don't notice any significant difference to the bees at all yeah that's like when nicole was mentioning um bees Bees will move the cluster up in your boxes if you leave your excluder on, and the queen will be left down below during winter time. So you have to take your excluders off for winter. So um, just just watch out for that. Um, you know, I do a lot of nuke cells, Rick, but I also do a pretty good bit of honey production as well. Um, bees are definitely a bigger money maker for us than honey is, and that's just because. It, even in poor years, you can produce bees. It's a little, it's still harder, but you, some years that are really rough, you just can't produce as much honey. That's all there is to it. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll bring the mic a little bit closer to myself. I've been accused of being loud a lot in the past, so I err on the side of caution. Now, if Laura was here, she'd have to be like like this right here because she talks so quiet. <laughs> I make up for it. Yeah, so Ian really um, should feel bad. I mean, pulling off four, five, six, seven, eight supers off and, you know. But then again, you got to consider it's all about location. It's you either have it or you don't. The flora that's out there, and even if it's there one year, it might not be that as good the next year 
or some crops that might not even be there at all. There's some years where like you'll have a good crop of basswood. Some crops are like that. They don't produce the same each year, even if the weather's about the same. Some plants only produce big crops of nectar every three to five years. And, and um, elevation plays a big role into some plants. Temperature makes a huge difference to some plants. Some plants aren't that sensitive. Moisture in the soil makes a big difference. Lots of different factors that go into what makes a good honey year. And when it comes to making nucleus colonies, honestly, when we make our splits in spring, we're feeding them whether there's a good nectar flow or not. Now, if it really kicks on good, we have to back off or we'll plug them out and send them into the trees. But if, as long as you're paying attention, you can just back off and let nature feed them in a good year. In a bad year, you just you know feed away and you can still produce nucleus colonies. Have you ever used Honey Bee Healthy? They recommend, um, yeah, the recommended amount is crazy high. And you know what? It's fantastic at that recommended dosage, especially when you're healthy bee company selling those or healthy uh, bee healthy company. I think it's, I've used it before and it's been years and years ago. The pros that I like to talk to and listen to and chat with don't use it. They don't need it. And it's expensive. So to me, it's a, there's already so many other things I can blow my money on because there's no limit to those things in beekeeping. It's just an unnecessary thing to me. It works good for preventing your syrup from spoiling, but that outside of that, I see no benefit to using any of those products, whether it's Man Lakes version, Honey Bee Healthy, any of those things. I really think a lot of that stuff, just, just me personally, is a waste of money. And I have I have wasted my money on those things before. Some supplements are good, um, like um, pollen patties, like in today's video, when I was going through those little bitty colonies, they are at a crucial period. Those Michael Palmer queens have just started laying. The pollen flow is not really consistent right now, and plus, all of those bees were made in a different yard. They're almost 100% nurse bees, very little foragers, small cat brood nest, that first round of brood, and, and the second round too, but especially the first round is super critical feeding a little bit of pollen patties to smooth out consistently nutrition throughout the day. We don't want any hiccups for those little colonies, especially this late in the year it can make a huge difference. Is ultra B as good as good pollen? It's not even close, but it can really make a difference. Hey Earl, I don't have any mated Queens for sale. I'm trying to between the Michael Queens and my Queens make about a hundred more splits over the month of August and I'm going to keep what I have. And if I end up with some extras, I will not be announcing it here because it'll be like a mob. <laughs> I, I won't have enough to go around and then it's going to get crazy. Um, but we're hoping to focus more on queen rearing next year, like a lot more. And maybe we can get some of you all some, some Queens on here in smaller quantities. And when I say smaller, I'm talking like five to 10. Let's see. If you want to. Ways to rehydrate a slightly dried up pollen patty. Um, Yuri, um, I found um, when I've tried to do that once or twice, um, using a syrup, a thick syrup really helps. Now, again, if you don't have access to that, that's where it can, it can be a little tricky. Um, because whenever you make a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one or a thick granulated sugar water ratio, it's it's still chemically quite different than a thick syrup. It hasn't been inverted. It's not as thick. And syrup draws moisture in, whereas one-to-one -one and stuff dries out really bad. And that's why when we were using Michael Palmer's recipe, which I, I that's the first pollen patty video that we have in our playlist, it worked really good as long as I ate it, excuse me, quickly. But because it was made with a sugar syrup recipe, you had to use the canola oil, canola oil, corn oil, vegetable oil, some oil to keep it from drying out. When we use the pro sweet or sucrose or whatever that we've got our access to, it's totally different. They don't dry out. They get wetter and they'll soak, soak on a humid day. If you leave them out, they'll be fine and they'll just start running out of the, the parchment. So it's just, it's all about chemistry, but if you have access to some of that, it works really good. Okay. Hey, Candy. Um, 
good to see you. I hope you guys are doing good in the eastern side of the state. Um, that's from people sending us um, money. And it's really, it's kind of awkward taking money on, on a platform like this. Laurel says it's not, but it, it, it is. Don't give me that look. Um, no, thank you very much, Terry and everybody else. Um, I hope that we've made your first year easier. And let me tell you, I've been doing this 17 years and I've been hearing some of the two first year, second year, three year beekeepers. And you guys are having way more success than I was at that stage. And it's not just because of me. It, we're getting more access to better information, whether it's from here or other places. And that that's important. I think it's very important to the beekeeping industry that we have successful beekeepers and um, I just hope that we can help a little bit. Now, someone pointed out, actually a couple of people did, when I did that Kelly's video that I'm trying to promote Kelly's and, and Man Lake, which is one of the same. It's not quite the same. It is, but there's still some differences, primarily the employees that work there. A lot of them have been there for, some of them as long as I've been alive. I'm not going to name any names, otherwise they'll hunt me down. But I, they, they've got families to support. Um, they do their best, I feel like. And I rely on businesses like that. I have to, I, if Man Lake and Kelly's were gone, I would be in trouble. I need access to some of that product. And it's different for me than it is for you all because I can purchase in bulk. When you're buying 300 boxes, you can get a lot better price than you can buying one or two. And I, I was, I remember back in those days, it's a lot more expensive. That's why we recommend you guys checking the Amish out down there. As much as I love them, I also realize you guys got to save money. Um, I try to save money, build your own equipment, that kind of thing. But the Amish fellas, you can save a lot of money there. There's other places to get it. But there are some really important stuff that I can only get at Man Lake and Kelly's that are crucial to my business. And I've got to have them. You know, that's one of the blessings of living in a country that like we do is we have access to these things. And a lot of them we don't need like honey, be healthy. I don't think we need that. Um, but I would rather have access to too much stuff than not enough. And I, through this channel, I've been able to meet so many of you all um, online. And some of us live in countries where you just don't have access to these things. You can't get a good pollen supplement. You can't get even basic equipment near the price that we can because they just don't have the infrastructure and the economy to be able to do that. And so we sometimes we got to count our blessings, even if Man Lake's prices are too high in other areas. We just got to be more creative. And, you know, we need to get some young people to get out there and start doing some competition. 40, 50 years ago, I don't even think, uh, I, don't, I can remember when Man Lake started, but they were started in someone's garage. And now they're the behemoth that they are. So, I mean, it's obviously can be done again. Hope Man Lake's not watching. <laughs> hey, Stan, but um, thanks for coming on. I hope that things are doing well for you down there in the South. Um, I know that uh, it's it's stinking hot, but you just you got to deal with it. Not, not, not a whole lot you can do about it. We'll be laughing when it's December and it's 40 degrees and Ian Stepler's at 40 degrees too, below zero. <laughs> Uh, he's going to be on here in a second. Is it better to overwinter in a single or double deep? Now, if you, it really depends on your location, but also the size of your cluster. I have some really big colonies that will go through winter and come out with more than 10 frames of bees. However, I'm starting to get to the point where I'm splitting my bees in fall, trying to actually keep them more of about a 10 frame strength or so. And in that way, Instead of having a 16 frame colony going through winter of coverage, I can break that in half, eight frame here, eight frame here, and then I can end up with two. Um, honestly, they both do well. I overwintered some three frame colonies that did really good this year, not on honey production, but just making a lot of brood for me. It's really more about a healthy cluster that's not getting eaten on all winter long by mites and having a good queen and, and plenty of food, obviously. But, oh, Ian is on here and I'm making fun of him already. Not negative 40 yet. Don't worry, Ian. It'll be here. And and as much honey as you pull, you really deserve it. I mean, the rest of us are sick of all that honey that you're pulling. I hope you had a really good year, actually. I, you have a pretty good honey year this year? Hey, Mike. Appreciate you as well. And uh, glad that we're able to help you a little bit. Got some questions, guys. Ask away. 
So um, one thing that we've been doing more, I and mean, it's different for us. Ian's got a really intense season during flows and stuff. It's very short, and you got to get things done quickly. Um, is what I've been. Yeah, Ian's like, I'm sick of honey too. <laughs> An embarrassment of riches. Laurel's over here, like me too. I'm, I'm sick of it too. <laughs> yeah, she had a. I actually wasn't able to help for a while due to certain circumstances and Laurel had to do a few barrels by herself and she's like, I'm sick of honey as well. Um, kids aren't quite big enough to do some of the, you know, lift the deep boxes, but um, we'll get there. But um, one thing that I found again is I like going ahead and leaving those queen excluders on after our spring flow is done, even though we're not planning on making any more honey when I'm going through the bee yard, I just, I know where everything's at. It's great. I know the queens down below. When we were making all these splits from those queens that we got in, we knew where we needed to get things from. When we were applying treatments. We knew where to place the treatments. We needed to find the queens because, oh, this queen's bad. We need to get rid of her and replace her. It's a lot easier to hunt down over nine or 10 frames in a, the bottom below the excluder over going through two or three deep boxes. Just make sure you pull it off before winter. Let's see. Ian, is your honey organic? It's Canadian honey, of course not. Uh, no, uh, I don't. I don't know what it is. Oh, are bees really endangered? Great question. Absolutely not. Um, but you. You know, it's not that they don't have their issues. They have more stressors now than they've ever had. Um, I, as far as are we worried about them going extinct? I'm not. Um, are we worried about them as um, a whole as far as their health? I, we totally are. There's constantly more stressors. People bush hogging a lot and eliminating the forage. People spraying herbicides a lot and eliminating the forage. In most areas like mine, I don't really don't feel it's as, as much as bees are being exposed to all of these herbicides and pesticides and fungicides because we don't have that much agriculture. And a lot of times in places like corn and, and stuff like that, the bees aren't going out there and working corn a lot. But it's just the fact that that corn takes up so much space where there's not any clover anymore. There's not any um, wild mustard growing out there. And there's no wing stem and goldenrod in the fall in these areas. So I think it's mostly an elimination of forage. So the nutrition, um, there is a certain degree of, you know, herbicide and stuff build up. I think that's really minimal in places like mine. Now commercial places it's higher, but I think a lot of it has to do with the you know, Varroa. It's a lot of our old literature back prior to all of these things talks about how easy it was to keep bees. And I think we're still riding on that mindset, especially, um, the older generation of beekeepers, and I, I don't mean anything against old, older beekeepers at all. I know some that are very, very adaptable and, and, and very intelligent, but beekeeping is not like what it used to be, and it's a lot of work. Um, it's still worth it, totally worth it, but you cannot just stick bees in a box and just let them just do their thing. It's, it's Sometimes you can get away with that, but more often than not, it bites you in the rear end, and in springtime, you're ordering bees from people, and that's expensive things have changed and, and they're and never the bees are never going to be like they were prior to those times before we had all these new pests but as beekeepers we can step in and try to give them the best conditions as possible they're sure there has to be a balance of re developing some resistance towards some of these things but we also have to realize that sometimes things change and they will never go back to the way they were before that's just the way that it is life being an adult sucks where's my okay what criteria do you use to determine if old comb is bad are there signs hey um stan so i have been using some combs that are half my age not that impressive i know but i know i have some that are at least 16 years old and i have very few of them left because we have been cycling them out I have never had any combs at that age that I just looked and saw, man, there's an excessive amount of disease in the brood or there's any disease, anything different from anything else that I'm seeing. I've never looked at a comb and thought, man, this is the cause of issues in this hive. 
Some people will say after a handful of years, four or five years, the cells get too small that the queens can't lay in them anymore. <laughs> it takes a long time for the combs to get to that age. Anyways, I do believe that comb rotation is a, a good practice, but I, I personally believe a decade is reasonable. Now, if you have too many combs, which you are in the minority of beekeepers where all of us are always desperate to have more combs, then you get to that point, that top out point, and you're just constantly drawing some combs out every year, then you can cycle them out every three to five years because you have so much. You just sell nukes off to some beekeepers. Give them your old five and six-year-old combs. But I've never seen anything that made me think that, man, my combs are getting old and it's causing my bees um, health problems. Why does the queenless hive tear down queen cells? Because if they get really far out of balance, bees get irrational. Well, they just, it's not irrational. They just don't make good decisions. Some people think that bees left to their own devices will always make the best decisions and they don't. Um, some hives, no matter how good of a queen you introduce, no matter what kind of cells you give them, they get too far gone and they're extremely hard to fix and they are problem colonies that need to be eliminated. I don't go in there and kill the bees, but we shake them out and we give the resources as long as there's no disease to somebody else. And it's easy to do when you have hundreds of colonies, but when you only have one or two, you know, it's a big hit. Um, but there are colonies throughout the year that just get too far gone, get out of balance, and they are way too much work. It's too risky on those expensive queens or those queens you spend all that time making make a new split. Usually by the time you fix them and add brood and do all the stuff to them, you've already made a split anyways, but you've introduced all that stuff into a hostile environment that has a lower percentage of success. Yeah. Kind of like that crazy might count hive, um, Bob, that, that colony is actually looking halfway decent. Okay. Hey George, thanks so much. Um, won't ask for us to kiss this time. I appreciate that. Laurel, um, you know, Laurel can only handle so much attention. Not me, though. I can handle all kinds of attention. What are you looking at me for? Well, you know, you just don't like all that camera attention. I, I guess I need to word things better before I get in trouble. All right. Just pulled Apivar off my 15... Um, triple, um, quadruple hives and made me appreciate how hard he, uh, we work. Oh, I appreciate that, George. Um, yeah, I, I really think that um, you, you kill those mites and it's going to really help you out. I think a lot of us, because it, it happens by just little degrees, very little degrees, your bees look good in spring and the trickle down effect is typically really slow My, unless you're really looking for it and you know what to look for by the time you start having issues with mites if you do see it when it happens then it's usually too late or it's really hard to fix it takes a lot of work to fix but a lot of us are negligent in summer because it's stinking hot we're busy and then we come back in fall and then our bees are so weak or they're they've absconded and uh, those mites just just kill them I don't really protect my hives from hot weather, Andrew. Um, you know, I, I like to keep mine in partial sh shade. I know that small hive beetle control, um, they say that having them in full sun makes a difference and maybe it makes a little bit of difference, but stressed out colonies are more susceptible to small hive beetle problems and other problems. And I like some shade. Let me tell you, this beekeeper right here hates working bees in Janu uh, January. Well, I hate that too, but um, July and August, um, and, and some, you know, that summer weather, it's very stressful and get heat stroke. I almost, I think I got pretty close this year once or twice. I keep them in partial shade on purpose. So I don't worry about that. I worry about strong colonies. If you have, if you're in an area though, that breeds some small high beetles year round, I would definitely look into some traps. I did beetle blasters. I don't like the oil, but the diatomaceous earth works pretty well. Hey, thanks. Annex games. We appreciate you very much. If you have a question, um, make sure to ask. Let's see. Do, 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 do. I like the guy that's got his name Clueless Beekeeping. That that's just we all at some point need to have that name. <laughs> I, I, there's days uh, just like, what's going on here? So like one of the things that I'm curious about, and I don't think that maybe there is, but I have not seen it is false little bitty swarms. 
and we're talking like softball type swarms sometimes will be a frame and a half to two frames of bees they're not very big and i'll have some colonies not very many but in a yard of 40 or 50 highs i'll have one or two of those every fall and they'll go up and they'll get in a tree and a lot of times they're queenless and they just run around for like a week and just you'll see a little swarm just coasting through the yard and i never tried it yeah, I used to years ago try to catch them and put them in a little box and either give them a queen or give them some eggs and let's see what they'll do. And I don't have time for that. Um, bees sometimes just make weird decisions, and I, I wish we fully understood that. That's one thing that still leaves me scratching my head. Yeah, the boss showed up. I got to be more careful. And uh, time to behave. That's right. B E E H A V E. And let's see. Oh, there, oh, hey, Mark, thanks so much. Um, hope you're doing well with your bees in your area this year. Let's see. You know, I've got some that are in full shade. I, I, was, in, I was checking a couple of them that don't ever see the sun, and they do have some, a decent bit of small high beetles in there. I think I shook. A lot of the times they get in my frame feeders, and I, I pulled one out to put it up in the second brew chamber, because we were moving from a single to a second deep. And I knocked it out. And they just, they hurt them all down into that frame feeder. And the bees are probably hating me right now. I crushed a lot of them, though. So I helped them a little bit. And when I shook that frame feeder out, there must have been like 60 of them come out of there. Maybe more. It was a lot. And that was just in the frame feeder. So we do have small hive beetles in shaded areas. But again, my bees are able to, to keep them at bay. The colony was probably only eight frames strong. But they were just fine. And I threw pollen patties on there. And I probably threw about three quarters of a pound on that colony. And they'll be just fine. They might The beetles might do a little bit of damage to the patty, but it'll be very minimal. A lot of times in colonies like that, um, I'll, I'll break it up if I don't have a patty. I didn't have patties today. I just scooped it out and just kind of put a little section here, a little section here, a little section here. So there wasn't like one big mass where the bees couldn't get to the middle very quickly. Yeah, small high beetles are a pain, pain, pain in the butt. I really hate them. Um, you know, they're just, it just makes you have to work harder. Hey, Chip, thanks for coming on. Good to see you, man. So Stan says, the folks that say there's plenty of pollen out there already, why feed pollen patties? Well, it really depends. And there's, I'm just going to take a second to answer this one. So if your county has bee bread, and plenty of it, you don't need to feed it. You don't have to. And if you're just wanting to keep a handful of hives and keep them as they are, and they have plenty of bee bread in there, and there's a little bit of trickle of pollen coming into, you're probably fine. It's those little colonies, those late swarms, those splits. They're the ones, or those colonies that don't have bee bread. And some, and some of us deal with different weather conditions. I mean, if you're in the dry part of Texas, I'm sure it's very different than the, you know, the more you know, green, you know, wetter parts of Texas. And I know some guys that live in some really dry parts of California and they'll have dirts for just months on end with no significant bits of pollen. And what we're trying to do is, on a, especially on splits, late swarms, all that kind of stuff, or colonies that we need to keep brooding because we're raising queens or whatever, we're just trying to help them out. Even if they're bringing in pollen, it might not be a complete amino acid profile. It might be missing some trace minerals. Not all pollens are great by themselves for the bees. Some pollens actually are pretty poor for the bees or almost useless. And so feeding those pollen patties can just help smooth that process, especially on young splits and stuff. It's just having a steady stream of nutrition makes all the difference on getting that first round of brood, getting that road speed, especially... Um, ground speed and especially as we're leading up into the fall we really want them to go as full throttle as possible is it necessary a lot of times probably not but it, it makes the percentage of success go way up you know feeding right now we're a long ways from winter but what we do right now really impacts winter it greatly impacts winter right what we do right now I think the chickens do help with a small hive beetle just a little bit, but definitely by itself um, is not enough. 
Um, I have not tried the Guardian entrances. I've looked at them. I've talked to some beekeepers, I think, that um, know a thing or two. And I think they have, I think they can be helpful. But by themselves, I don't think that they're going to be able to keep them at extremely low levels. Um, just, just me personally. I've seen what small high beetles can do on surfaces. That they're not supposed to be able to climb or go around. And they're a very, very tenacious critter. I would love to have a vehicle that had the ability of small hive beetle. It would be like a panzer. It would be awesome. A true all-terrain vehicle, pretty much. Um, I think they help, though. But my thing is, it's a pain for me to put them on. You reduce the entrance so small. My colonies are so big, and especially during the honey flow, I would constantly have to be putting them on, pulling them off. And this is, once again, where this might apply for a small apiary but it's not going to apply on a large scale. There's a lot of products like that. And that doesn't mean that they're not a nice product. It just means that they don't work on the professional level. It's just too labor intensive to fool with. Let's see if you want them. Yeah. Scrolling on. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we lose some Galen um, to small high beetle as well. It's almost always when a colony gets in the 11th hour and I don't get them shook out and combined with something quick enough and we have colonies that happen like that you know i had one colony this year that swarmed once and it swarmed again and it swarmed so much i mean it literally swarmed itself to death those swarms might be doing good but literally i was going to lose every bit of those combs because there was oh goodness almost three deeps worth of combs in there and i bet you there was not three frames of b coverage if you added everything and all those were like some of them were old bees and just everything was so out of balance. It was a mess. And the small high beetles started taking over and we bring them in, freeze them quickly. And uh, that worked pretty well. But still, had I not come back to that bee yard for three weeks, I'd have lost all of those combs and all that resources and bee bread. That bee bread in those combs is, is worth a lot to young splits. When is it too late to do a split in North Georgia? I mean, if you have a strong colony, Rob, and especially if you have a mated queen, it's you can you can make a split right now. You you can do it. Um, I made some splits last year, the first day of March, and when I made the splits, it was like thirty something degrees. And that night it was supposed to get I think in the upper twenties or, you know, maybe when I made the splits, I actually shook the bees. It was around thirty nine or forty. But anyways, you can do a lot of crazy stuff with bees as long as you know what you're doing. Um, we you have a lot of season left, but you, you got to make them ready to go. They've got to have a good laying queen. They've got to have the nurse bees to take care of her brood, and they've got to have the nutrition constantly all the way to winter. And you can totally do it. But doing like a walkaway split right now, even here, is, is, is pushing it. I don't like doing any of the best situation. Let's see. How many hives do we have? You know, we have somewhere... I was trying to count some of them up today, around 300. And, you know, once we actually consolidate everything down, as we're starting to do right now, we'll figure it out. But there's a lot of mating nukes that I've been letting go late in the year, and they're building up pretty well. And they're going to turn out into, I think, some pretty nice overwintered nukes. And some of them might even get to 10 frame size. So I think, um, you know, we're hoping to have 300 plus. But again, we're... I'm thinking more next year of downsizing a little bit into the 200 area just because um, things are getting pretty intense around here. And, oh, by the way, everybody, we uh, for those of you who don't know, we've started another YouTube channel. We're actually going to be just starting to release our first farming videos. It's all about basically the stuff that we do when we're not beekeeping because we raise meat birds. I've raised thousands of those, some laying hens. Uh, we do a lot of gardening. We do a lot of other farming stuff around here. So stuff that we're already doing anyways, we just thought we might as well do some videos on it. A lot of how-tos on, especially with the craziness that's going on in the world. It's nice to know how to take care of raising some of your own food. And it's way better for your health. And it can, it can be a lot of fun, just like bees, as long as, it, as you can get to that point where you're saving your own seeds like we like to do, which we'll have videos on that eventually. And those kind of things, it makes it more fun when you're not spending just tons of money every year. You know, it's not all, all about making money, but goodness, if you're shelling out loads of cash, 
constantly. It's just, uh, it hurts. It really hurts. I know the feeling. What's your mortality rate on nukes? So as far as going through winter stand, um, it's not bad. You know, we're probably looking, well, it really depends on the winter as well. Maybe eight to 10 percent, 15 percent on a bad year on nukes. It's as long as the bees are healthy, the nukes do really good in Tennessee. If Michael can overwinter nukes in Vermont, we can do it here in Tennessee. So, how do you tell if the bee bread's still good on um, frames that have been away from the cluster for a couple of months? Well, you can't. Um, I like to freeze it. Um, or find other ways to store the bees will chuck it out most of the time if it's not good but if it's really hard and set up in there and and got a lot of mold in it then they will actually entomb that and a lot of people read online oh if it's entombed pollen that means that your combs are too old or they're bad or your bees have been exposed to sprays it could be that you just got a little rainwater in your bee bread the water just changed the whole dynamic of the composition of the bee bread and now it, it fermented and if it gets really nasty in there the, sometimes the bees just entomb the pollen and cap over it and will not use that cell anymore and i've had them do that on first year combs because i left them out and they got rained in and they got really nasty in there and some of them they cleaned it out but some of them they just entombed it and those first year combs so um, the freezer is always the best way to store combs but it's hard to find that much freezer space. Now, Rob Tuttle, it's, it's, it's kind of like homesteading, but without the homesteading title. I always thought that sounded a little weird. Um, you know, I guess we could call this some beesteading um, channel, but no, it, it is kind of homesteading. Just more just raising your, making your own food, saving your own seeds. It's a lot of fun. I, I was into that way before I was into bees. Bees were just a lot cooler. Laurel's fixing to actually post the link to our new channel in the comments that you all are commenting in. So if you want, you can subscribe to that. No pressure. Um, we're not going to be hitting that really hard, and we don't plan on taking away from our beekeeping channel. Beekeeping is our bread and butter. But a lot of the stuff we're doing anyway, so why not make a video out of it? Let's see. <laughs> Canadian beekeeper Ian's like, are you switching to those pickle patties? I don't know how you smell pickles with those. Your Canadian pickles must be really strange. That doesn't smell like um, um, pickles to me, but I won't make a big deal out of it. Anyways, so did you get that, Laurel? No, she missed it. Any, oh, man, she missed all my good jokes. Um, any, anyways, no, we won't be switching to healthy bees. Um, not yet. They're hope They talked about maybe sending me some that didn't have any of the essential oils in them. Um, I'm not saying that they're a terrible patty at all, but I use patties to beef colonies up. And I really feel like the essential oils can have a, an, an, a problem, can, can cause an issue with the bees wanting to brood full, full throttle. I think we should look more into algae myself. Um, some of the research shows that you know it, it could be really good for promoting natural bee gut bacteria which anything that we can do to help promote <laughs> promote these natural gut flora is awesome and maybe mixing it into an ultra bee just purchasing some spirulina and doing that i've thought about doing that mix getting some and mixing that with my ultra bee mix um but i don't know it's just like anything new as you know ian um there, there's a lot more questions than answers right now but they're expensive too even in bulk you know about buying in bulk, don't you, Ian? Hey, Hillbilly. Um, yeah, you can totally use some first-year combs that were killed um, by those big black ants. Um, just protect it. Keep wax moss from getting into it. Keep small hive beetles from getting into it. Reusing combs is awesome. It's just like popping in a cassette tape. It's, it's just great. Yeah, I just I think that's one of the problems with you know the the essential oil kind of movement in general is that they they really are a double edged sword and I'm not against us tinkering around with it and and discovering more because I think there is some merits but where's the line 
we know that some of these essential oils can be really devastating. I had uh, a little bit of years ago, uh, a little bit of something on my arm that was, uh, what was it? You remember what it was? Ringworm? Yeah, it, it was it was something that was um, giving me some irritation. And so I decided to put some straight essential oil on it, right? It was a eucalyptus, really potent, high quality stuff, right? So I thought, you know, if a little bit's good, it must be really good. And uh, I put it on there without cutting it, like they said. And Laurel's like, you should have asked me first. Well, if I ask you to do everything first, I want to have half the fun now, would I? <laughs> so, anyways. I'm just kidding. But um, anyways, I put that on there and it killed that stuff like within a day or two. So I was like, yes, this essential oil stuff is the bomb. It took two layers of skin with it and left a mark on my arm for a couple of years. So I think that kind of that analogy works with the bees pretty good. I really do. It, it can it can cause sometimes damage as well. Let's see. Have you ever lit a hive on fire with an essential oil fogger? I know a guy. That's not surprising. <laughs> what would you? What would the bees do if you put fermented or bad honey frames in a hive? Um, the problem is, is that can cause some gut problems and dysentery. It really depends on how bad fermented. If it's just like the top layer and underneath it's pretty good, um, then it might not be so bad. But if it's like where small hive beetles have got in there and slimed it up really bad, and you know there's just little bits of honey and stuff that are fermented. Um, you can take a little, you can spray that a little bit and clean those combs. And I've actually um, done that and you can get some of that out of there. They'll, they'll, as long as the combs aren't too heavily damaged, they'll reuse them. It just really depends on the damage. Hey, a scruffy, the janitor, that, that is true. And um, overzealous newly mated queens are really good about laying several eggs in a cell they just they've got to get those eggs in there for those of you who've seen really young queens they they almost look translucent in their abdomen it's so swollen they're producing so much and all of that chemistry is pretty much going full throttle and what happens a lot of times especially if it's a, a small colony that queen's capable of laying up to the capacity of a honey production hive but she doesn't have the, the nurse bees and the combs and the bee power to make it happen, but she still fills the need. And so she, she'll, she'll come back to a cell she just laid in and she'll, she'll lay it up again. They get desperate just to get those eggs out, poor things. Um, but eventually they'll eventually gear back down. But that, it's, it's great though. If you can feed those bees and boost, give them the boost as much as possible to take advantage because for a short period after queens first start laying, they really, they just want to lay. That's all they want to do. And if you can give them the right conditions, they can build up some colonies pretty quickly and turn some things around for you. Let's see. My bees are feasting on fallen apples. I'm wondering if this will clear out their guts or make more problems. Actually, Dan, um, if they were going to, so to winter like right now, that could actually cause some dysentery problems. But chances are they're going to clear their guts long before um, you know, winter really hits. They'll have time to get that out of their system. A lot of those kind of things, that just shows you the desperation they are for nectar right now. They would not be going after apples if there was sufficient nectar out in the field. But bees are opportunists and they're capitalists and they're going to go out there and they're going to get everything and anything, even if they have to get it from another beehive and, and sack that hive in the process. It's, they, they don't think. They just they are programmed to find it by any means necessary. And, um, th but yes, those kind of sugars can cause dysentery. And that's why I think we have to be careful because there's so many people online saying, throw bananas into your hives, throw watermelons throw this throw that and you can do it at certain times of the year but the new beekeeper who reads that in winter time we're all hemmed up indoors and you're just like what can i do to help my bees out well this person says bananas is good and you're in an area that's like you know the north part of the united states or in canada where you have some serious winters and feeding stuff with roughage 
during that time of the year where they can't get out and get a cleansing flight for a long period could could really mess up your colony bad. Where if you did it down here in Tennessee where we get a cleansing flight in January, no problem, then you might hardly not notice anything. So you have to be careful because sometimes southern people southern beekeepers can mess you up because they can get away with it and they think that well if it works for me it works for everybody you have to be careful let's see here but yeah um, one thing i wanted to mention again is like when i did that that kelly beekeeping video um again some people are like well you're you know, your support, you're, you're promoting all Man Lake stuff and Kelly's. Well, I've done videos on Dayton. The way I look at it is the first time I went to these facilities, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And some of them that I've gone to, Kelly's is not one of them. When I got there, I'm like, wow, this was kind of a waste of my time or this was not what I expected. And so I feel like doing these videos, since no one else really does them, it helps give people an idea of what they ex are going to see. Some people are going to go to those places and be super thrilled. Um, some people are going to go there and be like, man, I can make that for half the price or I can get it from this Amish guy. I'm not really promoting. And as much as I promote some of the stuff that they have, for every product that they have in those places that I love, there's probably 10 products that I think are stupid. That's just, you know, but nine other people might think those products are great. You know, I there's a lot of products in beekeeping for sure, but I just... Like with the Man Lake boxes, I like the handles on them compared to the old Kelly's and a lot of the other traditional boxes because I can get more of my fingers into them. The joints on those Man Lake boxes, I'm not super thrilled with. Pros and cons. Um, and this is the way life is. But I'm not going to shoot. I'm not going to shoot them down entirely. I'm going to. I like to look for the positives more than the negatives. There's a lot of negatives, and if I want negative, I can just turn on the news. That's they specialize in, in whining. What do you do for a water source for your hives? We have so much creeks and ponds and rivers around here, Jack. I don't do a thing. Um, just don't. I don't have to. Um, if you're going to do something um, to help your bees out, some areas you need a water source, then a lot of times you can just put out a wash tub or something like that and put some wooden floats in there. They'll find it if they need it. If they're not using it, then that means they found somewhere else to get it from. A lot of times a neighbor's swimming pool. Let's see. Are you going to experiment with eco wood treatment on your boxes instead of just dipping them? Hey, Todd, I really want to do that. Um, I'm not sure when I'm going to get around to that. That is on uh, my list of things to do because a lot of us can't afford to do um, wax dipping. And I really like it. I love wax dipping, but apparently this eco wood is supposed to be pretty decent. But then again, I've heard a lot of stuff that was supposed to be pretty decent. It was pretty bad. So I would like to try it out. We'll do about 10 hives with it. And, you know, just we can see over the next three to five years how it does. I wonder if it starts showing some wear after, you know, four or five years. If you could redip it again. I don't know. Um, I really like the thought of it, um, you know, being the natural product that it is. Let's see. I'm in central Kentucky. My bees look like they are still bringing in nectar. Looks dark. Should I still feed them? By the way, they are too deep started from this spring as nukes. Hey, if, if your bees have plenty of honey and they're still bringing in nectar, don't worry about it. Um, obviously, if that's the case, then they're meeting the, re the requirements for their energy source. I would be looking at now the brood and, and seeing that the larvae, there's a pretty uniform group of bees uh, brood in there and that the larvae are have some royal jelly down around them in, in the younger stages and if all that stuff's lining up and you see bee bread in there and you know they're bringing in some pollen then things are great and, and that's the thing too i mean if i had one or two hives in one location it would be very very different than if i you know here at the house i think now with these splits that i brought up here temporarily i'm back up to over a hundred here now which is bad. Oh my God. I'll be moving about 60 of those out pretty soon. So try not to keep more than 40 to a yard, but that doesn't seem to happen. Yeah, Stan, the neighbors usually don't like bees in the swimming pool. Nothing like jumping into a hive, doing a hive, a swimming pool, doing a cannonball and getting stung on the rear end. 
Hey, Yuri. I'm, you know, I've been impressed with the, the app of my, uh, my uh, bottom boards. Um, I, the only thing I don't like is that they're not removable. Um, some of, well, some of them are like the, just the pollen trap. They don't come with it. Um, I do like being able to get pretty easy access underneath the bottom box checking for swarm cells. I don't like having to go through all the frames. A lot of times I'll look underneath and if they're starting swarm cells, then I'll go through the frames. But if I don't see anything underneath, I just close it back up. Um, but overall, the you know the the pollen trap, being able to catch small hive beetles, being able to uh, vent them with the screen board, and also it closes pretty tight whenever you want to cut off the the screen bottom. Um, they're pretty nice. Um, it, does, it's, it works really good. Um, you know the chlorinated water. I don't know how much that affects the bees. I do know that they like it. Some of the salts in there. I really don't know if it's, it helps them or it actually hurts them or not. Mark's like wax is the only way painting sucks, and I have to kind of agree with that. Um, I painted a lot of boxes, and wax dipping is just so nice. I ought to I ought to have a wax dipping party one day. It sounds kind of odd, but maybe uh maybe one day we could we could do that during the off season. We could you know, and obviously we can't have hundreds of people show up, but have a limited amount of people show up, maybe 30 or 40 people, 20, something like that. And, and do some wax dipping and, and building some equipment and stuff like that. would be kind of fun, especially during the off season when we're not so busy. <laughs> Galen's like, my wife is never as quiet as long as yours is. What's your secret? She's just super shy. She's just incredibly shy. You are, don't give me that look. When you're around people that you don't know, you are so shy. But once she gets to know, to know you, she, she'll talk quite a bit. You know, when I got married, I thought I was going to end up having this really quiet wife. But, you know, once your wife gets to know you, it's different with me. I mean, she talks my ear off here at the house. But, you know, it's, it's not too bad. There's no secret. It's it's just the way it is. And I better stop. Galen, you're going to get me in trouble, darn it. Uh, hey, Wes, I don't know where the most economic way will place to, to purchase wax. I, I just I don't. I've only purchased from one location. I've looked around a little bit, but it's close to me. I can drive and pick it up if I want to and save me on shipping and i know that it works um, i'm sure there's cheaper places to buy it i also want a high quality wax as a very high melting point because i don't want it to leach out of the boxes at any point during our hot summer and some of the cheaper waxes will do that and i've had some friends that went on the cheap route and they ended up with like a ton of wax that was bad and it started leaching out of the boxes hey guys how's it going uh down there towards Memphis. I know he's been making summer honey. See, and this is again, variables people. Um, he's down there making honey in a different part of the state. And I'm just like, I can't make honey at all this time of the year. There's no way he's taking supers of honey off and I'm feeding syrup location, location, but he's got cotton fields and, um, some soybeans. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with soil fertility, you know, down there, all that, river bottom silt and everything from the flooding i mean just it, soil is totally different i've got terrible subsoil up on these ridge tops when should you ramp down on feeding curtis asks that's a good question and it really depends on the hive i mean some hives right now i'm hardly feeding them a thing they because um they they socked away a pretty good bit of honey but i was also having to feed them um, to a degree and I didn't have my honey supers on because the season just wasn't that good. So some of them are good. I mean, I, I'll, I'll just throw a little bit in there and just like, all right, you know, you're good. But you know, some of my little guys I was feeding today, I put two gallons on them and they really needed it. Um, they really needed it. So it just depends. As far as gearing down, I like to see all of my highs where they need to be food wise in October wait much later than that and it's hard to get them to suck the syrup down you can get them to take it in but it's really slow and honestly the best way to put on poundage quick is really thick two to one or better if you can get you know pro sweet or sucrose or fructose 
or high fructose corn syrup, whatever. Um, I don't really like high fructose corn syrup, but I know beekeepers like Gus who use it all the time during um, when he's not producing honey and he does very well with it. So it obviously works and you can get a good price down there for a Cargill. Obviously get it to them early, but you can feed in Tennessee in December. You can put an inverted jar right over the cluster or a two gallon bucket and they will suck it down. We had 60 degree days in December last year. Hey, Kenneth, I, I didn't want to miss you. Um, Man, we really appreciate that very much. I'm not sure if I've seen you on here before, but I know there's been a couple of Kenneths, so maybe I already saw you and just you're one of the Kenneths. But if you got a question, man, ask. Appreciate that very much. Let's see here. Yeah, we have a lot of clay soil in Tennessee, and we have a lot of rock. That's why they call it Rocky Top. So what do you recommend to feed over winter for a new hive? Now, okay, there's tons of stuff for this. There's patties that are more winter patties, and, you know, the Man Lake has their, you know, pro winter patties or whatever they are. I, I used a couple buckets of those last year. I really wanted to try those out because a lot of people are like, these are great, these are great, and they work in a pinch. I don't like using them. They will, if your bees are starving, that works. You need to throw it on there if you can get it. But why are your bees starving in wintertime? Get to them early. Get to them in September. Get to them in October. If you're in a colder area, maybe get to them in late August. Get to them beforehand. Feed them cane sugar. Um, go to your supplier or, I mean, or beet sugar. It'll work too. Cane's better, but not much better than beet sugar. The main thing is that it's a non-GMO. But you can go to Wally World right now. I think you can get it for... Oh, goodness. I think 38 cents a pound at my Wally World, anyways, if you can get it. And it works great. Feed it to them two to one or just a little bit thinner. I usually have a hard time getting to two to one, so I, I just get as thick as I can. And um, get it in there early. Pack them away. If, there, if you have eight frames, ten frames of bees in a cluster, I want to see a good eight to ten frames of capped honey or capped sugar syrup in that high, which it's the thickness of honey at that point. Get it in there early. If you do that, you don't need these supplemental feeds. You don't need these candy boards. You don't need all this stuff. We don't use that stuff. We don't, you know, Ian Stepler doesn't use that in winter. Now he throws them in a shed. Um, so I guess, you know, there's that, but you know, you don't need them as long as the bees have food and they're healthy, they, they can handle it. It doesn't mean you, you can use that stuff, but it's just not necessary. Where would you place eight of our strips on a Michael Palmer four over four? So I would put one down, you know, if they're brewed in, you know, top and bottom box, I'm going to put one down the bottom, put one in the top. Um, definitely um, just put it in the center. Just get it right there in the middle. And that should work just fine. On, on So you'd have four strips, I guess, if you had four, one here, one four here, four from here. Here, 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 strip, strip, and that, that should work great. Best way to overwinter uncapped nectar. Um, the beads are going to dry it down. Uh, you know, a lot of people, they look at their honey frames and they're like, you know, I've got all this nectar in there or sugar syrup. They just haven't capped it. Sometimes bees just don't. They, they don't really want to cap it if it's not necessary, especially if they're consuming on it. It's just counterproductive to cap it. They only cap it if they just like, man, we're not going to use this in a long time. So it could be completely dehydrated down to the, what it needs to be, but it can still be um, left open. Last year, I had to use my refractometer on a ton of frames that were barely capped, and they were well below the 18% um, threshold of moisture content for removing honey. Um, some of them were like 16 point something. I mean, they were really low. They There wasn't hardly any cappings on them at all. Um, one, one way it's easy to test is just take that frame and just shake it. You shake it like that, and if it's real thin, it's going to fly right on out of there. And if it's kind of halfway in between, you'll get a little bit. And if it's honey thickness, you probably won't get a, a single drop come out of there because it's just too thick. So um, the shake test is what that's called. I don't really recommend that for harvesting honey, but definitely if you're concerned, bees ripen. A healthy hive ripens these things really quick, even in cool weather. If it, you know, but you're still getting in the 50s and 60s, but you're dropping down in the 30, you know, 30s and low 40s they're still pretty good about ripening that stuff up make it as thick as you can and get it on early and um you know 
I know beekeepers who were feeding two to one in December last year. Bees can move the moisture out pretty good if they're a strong, big cluster. If some of you guys watched my ProVap video, and I think it was in January, late January, and I popped this hive, and it was, it was like 24 frames of bee coverage. It was awesome. It produced like 100 pounds of honey this year. Made, a, made at least, I made two splits off of it this year. Awesome hive. And, you know, those, you can't hardly kill a hive like that unless you do something really crazy. They can take syrup in the wintertime. They can take pollen, three pounds of pollen patties that time of the year and all kinds of crazy stuff. Testing the gas VAP de device. I haven't had a chance to test that and um, it looks pretty interesting. I, I might test that in the future. Um, a lot of that kind of stuff, it, it's now getting to the point where if they'll send me a product, um, I'll, I'll try it out and do some videos on it. Um, but we're getting so many products coming in these days and a lot of people asking, especially Chinese people, no. Um, a lot of those products are just knockoffs of someone else's original version. Um, but we, we, we are going to be, we're hoping to spend more time trying things out next year, but this year, goodness, it's been crazy. Thankfully, not too crazy. We're still alive. Yeah, the nectar flows, I'm not doing them a whole lot, Brian, um, right now. Is Nebraska a good place for bees? I've never been to Nebraska. Um, and I would say that there's certain places in Nebraska that are very good for bees. Um, there might be some areas that are, are very, very poor. Same way with the state of Tennessee. I, I mean, goodness, I literally have some bee yards that are eight miles apart as the crow flies. Phenomenal difference in nectar and pollen forage. Up here on the ridge tops, the soil is just a lot poorer than it is in the bottomland. And also, there, you know, just like my, you know, Gus, who's on here, he sticks his close to cotton, and he makes huge crops off of that. I don't make any cotton, honey. It's just, there's just not anything like that around. So, it, location is so important. You might have a phenomenal location, and also hive density. Your area might support forty colonies in the yard. It might only support. 10, 4, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's some pretty inexpensive refractometers on Amazon, but um, I've had good results with them. Pretty inexpensive. I got some on my, um, if you guys go to our description, there's the Amazon links. Um, and how that works is it doesn't cost you anymore. If you click that, um, we do get a tiny percentage of whatever Amazon charges for that product but you know it doesn't add to your cost or anything there's a refractometer on there that i've purchased and I, that's one i use i like it it works good i had one person that purchased it and said theirs came a little didn't work it was a little busted up but they did send it back and they got you know refunded that's the nice thing of getting stuff from amazon is if you know it doesn't live up to your expectations um you can send it back right away and, and get a refund yeah stan i really think that john um Oh, easy VAP is um, really nice, especially for the money. Um, hey, Dave, we do have some sourwood, but we have very few of them in this area. There's a, lo a lot of logging here. And also, they, prov they do better at higher elevations than we are. So we have a little bit, but it's, it's not enough to make any impacts on our honey crop at all. And what little there is just goes to helping our bees through summer. Hey, Hi-Fi, um, no problem. Hey, if you're beekeeping, that's always a good excuse for missing bee chats. Um, uh, that's no problem at all. Always a good time to be in the bees. Let's see here. Hey, Mark, thanks so much. Um, would the new Queen's nukes be all right in a divided Apame nuke box, three frames for 11 days starting today, south of Jackson, Tennessee? Okay. Would new queens nukes be all right and divide it half of my new box? So uh, are you talking about your, like, uh, the seven frame that you, like, put the divider down? Are you talking, like, the full size? Either way, it'll, it could work. But I've got the seven frame apame that I've been using for mating nukes all season. I'm fixing to actually pull one out and just let it go solid. Um, you totally can do that, it's, especially when you're making small splits or young splits and are introducing queens. Smaller hives accept queens typically better. And especially if they're small, then they do better in a smaller cavity because it's just easier to control the thermal dynamics in there. It just makes it so much easier on that little colony. 
even if it's hot outside, you know, during the days, they don't want it to be a heat index of 98 degrees in there. That's a little too hot, especially with the humidity and stuff like that. And at nighttime, we're getting in the sixties. It's too cold. So, um, maybe, um, explain to me if you're, what size of app of my app of may, whatever. I can't, I don't know. I can't, I don't know why I have such a problem with that. Yeah. Hi fi. I really like the app of may a seven frame as well. Um, I was really, I've really enjoyed those things. There's a few things about them that I don't like, but overall um, they work a lot better than I thought they would. I love the pollen trap and I love how easy it is to divide the colonies right now. Um, my big app of May hive, I've got two really nice Queens on both sides and there's five down below five above. I'm going to have to pull some bees from them or something because they're getting too strong now and uh, they'll probably swarm on me and fall. I'm not saying everybody needs to go get one of those things. If you do, though, um, you can go to one of our AFMA videos and go through our link. Um, we actually are an affiliate with them now. So if you go through our link and purchase from the AFMA website, um, we actually get a percentage of that, which will go to help boost our channels, um, what we're able to do. Um, you don't have to, just the thought. Let's see. How do you enforce social distancing with your bees? Well, our, our hives are, you know, our pallets are about three quarters of an inch. And if you think about how big a bee is, you know, it's probably about six feet. I, you know, uh, I'm actually, I'm not going to get into that. All I got to say is if you go to the CDC and the World Health Organization and you do the math yourself, numbers don't lie. Let's see. Yeah, goldenrod. See, the early goldenrod um, does not do very well here. Um, the bees are kind of messing with it a little bit, but there's several varieties of goldenrod. And the earlier ones that are more horizontal um, don't produce a whole lot for our bees. There's some that grow and bloom more vertically, and they are having started to bud yet. And that's what our bees really like. That's when you really get that strong goldenrod smell. Um, but right now they're just tinkering around with it. The ragweed, which kills so many people in fall, is fixing to bloom, but it produces so much pollen. The ironweed, the wing stem, it's all fixing to go. And with these rains we've been having, I'm really, really excited. Um, is small hive beetle less in your apame hives versus wood hives? I have not noticed a difference. Um, it's about the same. My bees are are really awesome, though. So... They, they just kick, they, they keep pretty strong, but honestly, I have not seen a difference. Um, I, I will say though, it's nice with that little tray that you can put underneath, just put some diatomaceous earth. If you're feeding pollen patties, um, any of the larvae that fall will die in that diatomaceous earth. So you're not sending larvae down to create more small high beetles. And also, um, small high beetles wind up down there too. I've, I don't know how many small high beetles I've killed down there in the uh, apame tray, just cause they we're messing around and fell down bees. I'm pushing them down through there. You know, bees, my bees are very aggressive towards a small hive beetle. You know, they can't really hurt them, um, but they can, they can harass them ag very aggressively. Yeah. Sorry guys. I kind of got that whole coronavirus thing going and I, I should not have done that. Um, I just mentioned, I just said something. People can go and do the own, their own math if they want to and figure out where things really stand instead of watching the news. But anyways, then, you know, then people comment on here and then Laurel, it gets belligerent and I, I apologize. I like people having differences of opinion. Obviously, um, I have to be pretty thick skinned with this YouTube channel these days because uh, everyone's telling me that I'm doing things wrong because if I do an app of May video, I have people like, yes, you finally doing that video. And then I have 50 people like, that's so stupid. And then I do something on Apivar, same thing. Or I do something on just treating mites in general with an, an oxalic acid provap. Oh, you're doing that wrong. And then I'll have, I had a PhD pick on me the other day. I'm, I can't win. I'm like Rodney Dangerfield, you know, you don't know who Rodney Dangerfield is. <laughs> I failed. Uh, Poor sheltered homeschooler, you. Hey. 
I was homeschooled too, but I had, I had a cool grandpa. It makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, uh-huh. I was homeschooled and I was still cool. That should be a t-shirt. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. No respect. That's right. Um, anyways, um, someone was picking on me the other day because um, uh, it was funny. No, I like being picked on when it's, it's all in good fun. I, 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 I don't discriminate when it comes to picking on people. I, I pick on everybody. Um, but basically, uh, there's my hair. And they were like, you know, you look like you're going to church or something like that, or you're fixing to do some preaching. When I was, when I was speaking at Kelly's on chickens, and I got a good kick out of that. And one of my best friends was like, yeah, he has preached before. And, you know, it it's kind of like listening to the Rolling Stones. You just don't get any satisfaction. And I'm just like, come on, man. I need some better friends. That's what I really need. Um and then the short joke started flying and, you know, whatever. How did you become a commercial beekeeper? I wouldn't really consider myself, Luis, a, a commercial beekeeper. Um, more in the professional range where, you know, we're making a significant amount of our income from bees and their byproducts of honey and, and selling splits and whatnot. Um, you know, we don't truck our bees around the country, which in the United States is more considered commercial. But it, tomato, tomato. Um, it took a lot of darn work, a lot of money, a lot of trying things out and learning the hard way and a lot of m money, um, just lots and lots, thousands, tens and tens of thousands of hours. And boy, I could, I wish I could go back and change a couple boneheaded decisions that I, I made, but honestly, it's just stupid hours, working stupid, long hours, having a long suffering wife and not giving up. All of you all, thank you. Laurel sharing her beef jerky with me. That means she loves me. Hey, jerky is awesome. But yeah, I mean, seriously though, just don't give up everybody. That's, that's all there is to it. Keep learning. Never get to that point where you think you know everything because you never will, which is a good outlook on life in general. Try not to you know, just don't give up. That's, that's the main thing. That's, that's, if I could take away one thing that I have done correctly over the last 17 years is not actually giving up entirely. There was many times I considered it. Well, you're right. You know, it's also having a wife that is very encouraging and helpful. Hey, Norma. Wow. 43 two pound bottles and <laughs> you sold it all already. Of course you did. Honey's like that. I promise you guys. It, there, as, as long as you can produce it, you can sell it right now. That's the way the market is. If you can produce honey, you can sell it. If you can produce bees or queens, you can sell it. If you produce pollen, you can sell it. Might be a little bit harder on some of those niche products. But if you go to a place like Nashville or a big city like that, you'll, you'll sell it. Even online stuff. Um, it's just a matter of production, and that comes down to fundamentals and bee husbandry. Do you ever get enough honey from the fall flow to harvest? Absolutely, Spencer. Most years we don't get a big crop, but you totally can here. Um, it's not near as prime as our spring honey. Um, I, Especially since I've been working another job three days a week, um, the last year or two. I haven't worked hardly at all since March, I'm just starting back up again. And I'm um, just really trying to prep myself for next season, put some money back in the bank account, and be prepared to just try not to work at all next year. And, well, so, oh, not work at all. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, not do anything but bees for a living next year. And, and in order to do that, I'm still trying to put the pedal to the metal. But um, I definitely am trying to focus a lot on next season and not just, you know, from us personally on a fi financial standpoint, but also just so we can have better videos. Um, obviously, the way, this is the way I look at it. If we're able to help people and get you the information that you all want, then that helps you and it does help us out. And that, that brings something 
um, to mine. Um, I've had some people comment on the the ads on the YouTube videos, and they a few weeks ago changed things. And I have I didn't know what it was going to do to it. Honestly, I hate technology, so I ignore YouTube most of the time. I, I hate it. But they, they changed it now to where if the video's like eight minutes or more, they every decent pause in the video, they throw in an ad. And I, I look back at one of the videos. I finally figured out how to access it. We didn't do that. They, they did all of that. And so, you know, usually I try to have a video at the front and a video at the uh, a video, uh, an ad at the front and the, an ad at the end. And that way, because we do need to make some money, obviously, or otherwise we need to focus more on the bees. But at the same time, they were putting like five and six ads in a 10 minute video. Just ridiculous. I don't want to watch videos like that. So the problem is, though, we've got like, what, 300 videos almost now? That probably means I have 200 and something videos that I've now manually got to go back and manually change all that. There was no option to opt out or anything. I'm not very happy about it. So I apologize right now, especially on the older content. It's going to be a little while, probably winter, before I have enough time to situate all that. But we're trying to go ahead and get the newer videos that way. Who's? Enormous? The ads. <laughs> uh, there you go. Came in e no work equals win lottery. You know, Brian, I mean, that's kind of the case. But I, I get bored so easily. I was that way as a kid. I hate boredom is one of my greatest fears. I hate being bored. So sure, I won't have as much stress on me. Obviously, because I just money all over the place. But I'll I'll be beekeeping still. I'll I'll be just doing it more for fun. I still probably have a couple hundred hives. I just can't imagine having less than that. It's too much fun. All right, so that's a great question. I'm not sure I'm fully prepared to answer it. Let's see. Um, top five things I wish I wouldn't have done. Where did that go? I, I, I lost it. It keeps scrolling. There we go. Top five B things you wish you didn't do. Treatment free. That's a big number one. Not even a close second. That, that impacted us early on big time and just cost us years of learning because we just weren't able to get to the, we just weren't able to get to second base. We just, we couldn't figure a lot of things out. And the internet is chock full of so much horse crap that you can, it's hard to sift through, especially when you're new. You just don't know. And we all have to make our decisions, but I, I've always tried to be with my garden and everything else as natural as possible. It has not worked that way with bees for me. Um, they're just, and I've tried. I mean, I, I've talked about this before. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I've tried. I have given treatment free more than a fair shake. I've blown more money on that than I, if I, if I heard the amount, I would probably pass out in this chair. That's how bad. All right. Number two. Formic acid. I used that as a treatment. So once I started getting into treating, of course, I wanted to use the most natural product, which is formic acid. It's certified organic. It's supposed to be good with honey supers. Obviously, it must be the best. Man, that wore the rear ends out of my beehives. I mean, it's just good-looking colonies, and it. I used it in the right temperature range, and it's just it's so rough on them. Even in the best conditions, formic acid is rough on the bees, and there's just no way around that. I'm not saying you can't use it in timely fashion and get some decent results, but you have to plan on your bees taking a step back and also going through super procedures and possibly those queens not coming back. Don't like formic acid. I think I mentioned that in the video this morning. I did. Or I guess it was after, after lunch, so whatever, this evening. Um, not painting boxes good enough. That was a big one. I've let so much equipment. This all comes down to blowing money. Everything's so expensive. Ouch. And the boxes, Michael Bush has a lot of stuff on the web. 
And one of the things that he had was about you know natural beekeeping and letting your wooden boxes breathe, man. And, you know, so don't paint them. Well, I'm all into natural stuff, right? So I did that. I'd already painted my, the first couple of years I painted. I still have some of those boxes. The boxes that I did not paint, long gone. We rot 365 days out of the year here. We rot things really good. And then after that, even when I started painting back again, I started listening to the don't paint the top and bottom edges because the bees will take care of that. So that kind of goes in the same category. Fiddlesticks, seal those boxes up. Seal them. I've got some boxes that Laurel painted before we got married. I still got them. They look great. Still using them. She painted them really good. Good job, Laurel. You're awesome. I should have listened to you years ago. Yeah, I figured the head nod was coming. <laughs> old, Red, uh, old Red is running really good, Aaron. Um, that truck is is made American. It was made to work. I have guys tease me about my little Prius, but I'm telling you what, I show up with Big Red, and I'll stick both of their trucks on the back of that sucker and haul them around. Um, it's Okay, so that was three things. Number four would be just, I have to put like a general overview on gimmicky products. There's so many products out there that you can waste your money on that overall don't really change your bees' health at all, positively or negatively, and they cost a lot of money. Just trying out a lot of stuff, and some of that's just, it's just part of the, the journey, and, and some of us have difference of opinion on what that is, but for me personally, there's just, it's so confusing. You get into beekeeping, and like, oh, you've got to try this, this honey, be healthy, or this pro-health. My bees produce so much more honey, and honestly, I think a lot of these supplements and these additives are just a waste. I do like Ultra Bee. I do like a couple little supplements, but nothing too crazy, and I guess number five, on things that I wish that I didn't do. Mm. Oh, this one should have been further up the list. When I got on, you know, early on in beekeeping, don't feed your bees. Nature's going to provide everything. If if they don't, you know, if they're good, healthy bees, they, nature will provide everything that they need. That is a load of crap. Anyways, moving on. So anyways, press, and I kind of talked about this earlier, so I won't mention a whole lot, but I, the Apame hives work really good. I don't like the plastic frames. I don't like the fact that the bottom boards can't come off. But other than that, I have really enjoyed them. The pollen trap is awesome. What kind of paint do you use? I waxed it mine now, but oil-based is better as far as preserving the box long-term, but it is more of a pain in the rear end, so I use latex. Just, you know. When you paint your boxes, plan on coming back five years later and just paint them again. They might not need it, but that's when you want to paint them is when they don't need it. You get that other co coat of paint on there later, get those tops and sides, rotate them, get them painted good. You do a good job like that, good primer, good paint, put a little bit of extra money into it. Look for those oops cells at Lowe's and other places and get some cheaper paint, multicolors, all that stuff. And just get it into that edge wood, get those tops and bottoms. You should get a decade out of the box, minimum. How did you expand into selling into stores more than just at places like farmer's markets? Well, it kind of happened a little bit naturally because we had some stores reach out to us early on because they wanted honey to be sold there. And it just works so much better, obviously, than doing one or two customers at a time. I just can't imagine trying to handle the volume. And that's my problem is, is I can't shut up. And so if I sell, stop laughing over there. <laughs> Got the peanut gallery over here. Anyways, everybody's a critic. I just missed my mouth. <laughs> Anyways, so we already had stores going like that. But if I had individual sales, I would talk to those people about bees for 25 minutes. And then you, you just sold them a $10 jar of honey. That's not very profitable. And these stores already have places that are bringing people in. I can usually, our average delivery to these stores is four or five gallons of bottled jars so it's worth it you know i'm going in there with at least a couple hundred dollars worth of product i won't come back until they've sold that i pick up the money they get the honey 
easy. Love it. No, I don't get a dollar an ounce, but you can't do that when you're selling drums worth of honey. And um, it's, it's just different. But I really do um, like selling it this way. I can focus my energy on making money off of my bees more. I can spend more time with my bees and less time selling one or two jars at a time. All righty. Where was I? Where was I? Okay, so stands like I've got 80 highs got just into a dearth. I need a feed. Which method do you recommend? Central PA. There's several good methods to um, feed. I, I use frame feeders because I was able to get a good deal on them. They're, they have some cons, especially in cold times of the year. Bees won't move over to get over to that frame feeder because they're too busy clustered. So if you're trying to feed, if you're wanting to feed bees late in the year, which you probably shouldn't be because you should have taken care of it before it got that cold then you're going to need something like a Pell or a, a jar, half-gallon jars, gallon jars, two-gallon Pells like Ian Stepler uses. I purchased a dozen of those. I've been using them all year. They're awesome. The only problem with them is raccoons really like to mess with them and knock them off and try to drink the syrup out of them. But um, everything has their, its issues, and they can blow off, obviously, and then you can your hive will be open and rainwater can get in there a little bit. But... Um, Definitely, um, pell feeding, um, I think, is a great way to do it. You can put on a lot of poundage quickly. Um, frame feeders work great as well. I mean, I think they're the most commonly used feeder. They used to be. Pells, I think, are starting to catch up. But frame feeders are used quite a bit, and healthy bees really don't drown unless there's just a bunch down in that frame feeder when you pour it in. Um, oh, it, Feed pump, yeah. Um, I've got a video on our setup. I haven't showed it actually in use. I'm going to try to get to that really soon. Um, but you can see pretty much how the whole system works on the back of my truck. It's probably about two weeks ago that I did a video on that. It's a really cheap system. Use a trash pump. It works great. Entrances and supers. Yeah, you can either – some people drill three-quarter inch holes, half-inch holes. Some people just put some shims under supers to allow bees to go in and out. Um, you it's kind of a personal preference. I, preference. I really don't do that a whole lot. I have some with and some without. Strong big colonies seem to produce really good honey crops. Um, but then I've got a lot more to learn when it comes to honey production, so I don't know everything when it comes to that for sure. How do you think Costco is managing to sell a three-pound jar of honey for nine ninety-five? They claim is to be USA honey. Well, chances are some of it's not american made honey but even if it was the commercial guys don't really make that much um because we're getting so much imported honey honey into the country you know the commercial guys are getting well under two dollars a pound for honey so i mean especially if they're mixing that with a little bit of foreign cheap garbage they may not be but i don't I don't trust the that stuff. It's it's too uniform tasting. That's that's my biggest concern. Is even there's a little difference from our spring flow from one year to the other. There's not a whole lot of difference, but you can still sometimes like two years ago it was a lot lighter than it was this year. I don't know why it just was, and uh, you know, I just their honey tastes like the same. You can go there and get you can go to a Costco you know, f far away and taste the same. Then you can go to a Sam's club and it tastes the same. They are just, I, I don't trust it. Let's see. Hey, um, from Australia. Um, I, I appreciate you being on here. Glad that you like our not no nonsense approach, but I'm not so sure it's all no nonsense i think it's there's a little bit of nonsense going on but not not too much nonsense um i goof around a little bit so goof ranch is asking how do we price our honey and so a lot of people are going to look at our prices and I, I guess i get some hate from some local beekeepers too because they're like you're so cheap and i don't consider it cheap when i got into beekeeping you could get a quart of honey for ten dollars no problem easy to find a quart for ten dollars and now everyone's charging 30 bucks a quart it seems like or more and uh which i love it you guys keep raising the price love it because when people look at my prices at you know six dollars 550 a pound at wholesale you know or whatever when when people you know when 
I'm selling it to a five gallons to a store at a time at five fifty and six dollars a pound, and they're not even blinking an eye because they know they can raise the prices a little bit and still undersell that dollar an ounce and all that stuff and move it like crazy. I love it. Price needs to keep climbing. <laughs> but no, seriously, I have no issue. You can sell it for $100 an ounce if you can get it. Um, it's a lot of work to keep bees, and it's all about marketing. Um, I'm really not good at that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I, I definitely, I, I feel like we do good. And if you can't make money at $5 and $6 a pound, you don't have a price problem. You have a production problem. Wing stem. Oh man, I love wing stem. I'm glad to see that it's blooming in your area. I love that plant. It's an awesome little plant. Most people don't even realize it's out there. I'm not saying beekeepers, just people in general. Bush hog it, bush hog it. Kills me. It's a wonderful little humble plant. So much stuff. And it's not just the bees. It's uh, There's so many other plants that depend on this stuff for habitat and food sources and raising uh, babies and, and offspring and stuff in them. So is it, um, what? I just lost it. Hey, Consume Honey. Um, thanks for listening to our talk. Um, it's good to um, see someone here from Puerto Rico. I hope things are going well for you guys. And um, uh, he's got a blog down there. I, you know, I don't really know much about beekeeping from that area, but I would definitely like to learn. So maybe I'll check that out. He or she or whatever. Sorry. You just never know on here. My... So Norma says my bees never stopped during the flow. Is that possible or did I miss something? And they did have a dearth. So um, if your bees have a lot of bee bread socked away and a lot of honey and you only have a couple hives, you might have a trickle coming in and they might be burning through some of that resources and they might be going, you know, the, but if they have a lot of extra because you didn't take a lot, then they might just be cruising along. You might hardly not see any difference at all, especially if you only have a couple hives. So and some people live in areas that have very short seasons that are very intense. A lot of variables out there. I mean, you just look at, you know, some of my buddies, like one of them's in Hawaii. And I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And then I know some guys that are up north. And even though they have a huge winter, they have an action-packed honey flow and pollen season. They don't really have much of a dearth in some of those locations, except winter, which is a monstrous one for them. So it, I don't know your area really that well, but there's just so many variables there. And that's why you have to pay attention. And then also, I mean, my information might be able to help you in some of these other channels, but ultimately you're going to have to take that and translate it into your area and see how it works for you because that is going to impact things. We're just, our, our goal is to get you fundamental information to where it's easier for you to see what's going on and be able to recognize those things and then be able to take it to tweak it to your area and advance it to the highest level as possible. And I know not everyone's trying to do a business, but everyone needs to run their bees like a business. It's not all about making money, but bees are a business minded insect. It's all about that profit. They don't want just enough to survive. They want excess that healthy bees love excess and they're going to go after it if they can. So we want our bees to do our best and, I, I don't think it, it's all, everything's all about money, but let's just put it this way. If you're breaking even, that's great. If you're making a little bit of money off of your bees over time, it's going to take a little while to get there. Then what, what do you do with that? You buy more bees. It's a great system. And now that, you know, we need to buy more bees, Laurel. Uh, we just need to get more and more. The problem is uh, now we're, no, we're, we're, we've maxed out, I think. Maybe when the kids get a little bit older, we put them to work. Maybe we'll get a few more beehives. Let's see. Yeah, Yuri, he's in an area, though, where they're in a serious dearth, 40 pounds of resources in a month. And um, that's a problem with some of the areas where it's really warm and mild. You know, it's it's always about someone's got this better than me. And, and there's always advantages and disadvantages. But some people are like, oh, man, I wish I had a warmer environment. But some warm environments are terrible. It's really stressful on the bees. The varroa mites produce a lot more, which makes it harder, more chances of viruses and, and other issues. Um, obviously, the cold weather has its issues, but if your bees are very active and there's nothing coming in, they're just burning through resources and stressing themselves out a lot of times. So 
the main thing is keep your bees healthy and they will do the best that they can for what nature will provide them with. You can have one nice, really productive colony and you can have two colonies over here that are mediocre and that one good, strong colony will produce way more than those other two probably put together. They just, they have that population at the right time of the year. And in areas like mine with the short season is all about having that strong hive. And it's all about location as well. But even in this very poor year that we had, we still had some hives that produced over a hundred pounds of honey. We definitely didn't average that, but those hives on those days where the, nature was kind they really took advantage of it you know leonard asked how much does each inspection put a hive back you know i've seen some research that says 48 hours 24 hours and some people start trying to figure out how much that can affect honey production and stuff i have no idea they need to be they need to be managed though if um if you're wanting to keep them in the hive from swarming during peak season and the way I look at it, when you get to the stage, and I'm not fully there, but I feel like I'm getting there, where you are knowing what needs to be done, you're quick about your inspections, you don't cause that much stress to the hive. Do you stress them? Obviously you do, but a lot of times, sometimes what we're doing is causing a lot less stress to the bees. Like when the bees need fed, yeah, it's going to disrupt them, but when we give them that feed that they need you could argue that overall it's, it's less stressful or, you know, we're creating less stress over the, the period of time. And it's all about opinions and point of views when it comes to a lot of this kind of stuff. It's kind of like the whole alcohol wash and sacrificing bee thing. A lot of people hate it. I don't like it. I do it. It, it makes a lot of business sense. It makes a lot of bee sense too. And this is where my argument lies. The bees are more than ready to cannibalize the larvae in a tough situation. They do it. If you're an old worker bee going into winter, you cast yourself out of the hive and you die because you're no longer useful to the colony and they don't want you eating all their reserves for winter. So, you know, you could have 15 frames of bees going into winter. And once it really sets in, you come back in a month later and there's half of that or maybe two thirds of them are gone or whatever, depending on how healthy your bees are and how many young bees are in there. All those old bees, they, they, they're gone. They, they're, they don't keep them around. They don't want them in there. They're going to, they're taking away at the percentages and the survivability of the colony. If you're a drone and there's not enough nutrition, you've got to go. If you're a bad queen, you've got to die. Some bees are not good at this though. Bees are not always consistent or perfect. You'll have some colonies that are wonderful at requeening themselves. It's a wonderful trait. You'll have some hives that will not accept a queen or won't requeen themselves properly. They do some things wrong. Um, those are poor genetics. Um, sometimes it's environmental conditions. Maybe they had great genetics and the queen got eaten by one of those robber flies um, or a, a, a red tanager or something else. There's so many things. What I'm saying is nature is all about survivability. And as a beekeeper, trying to do what I can for the bees, that's the way I look at it too. Every action, everything that I do that, that might stress the colony out, I try to do it in a way that when I'm going in there, over the, the long haul is actually less stressful on my bees. It's kind of like raising children. Not that I'm an expert on that. I'm trying to be. Not, not uh, Maybe by the time my kids are fully grown, I'll know what I'm doing. But seriously, as parents, we do a lot of things that teach our kids that are going to benefit them down the road. Sometimes it's stressful for our kids early on. Do you think my son wants to be put in timeout from his um, Lego game? No. Um, do you, when my, we have a wood stove, love wood stoves. I would take my kids and hold them over when they were really little because they could get access to it sometimes. And I would stick their hands right over the stove about three inches off until it it didn't burn them or, you know, damage the skin, but it got very hot and uncomfortable. And it started just to hurt a little bit. That was stressful. I've never had one of my kids get burned on the stove. And you know, one's pushing nine and one's fixing to turn five. I think a lot of it was attributed to the fact that we ex they experienced that stress. And long term, it yielded some better results. Now, 
Um, I, okay, we could get, I'm getting a little too deep here. I apologize. We'll get back to beekeeping questions, but I believe that what I'm doing overall is intended at least to over the long haul be beneficial and profitable to the colony. And I feel like the relationship between a knowledgeable beekeeper and a good hive of bees is a very powerful thing. I really do. I think together they are both better for it. Um, bees are not intelligent and sometimes it really shows they make some poor decisions at poor times of the year sometimes they can't help it they're a slave to their genetic programming not all bees are created equal well the comments are way down there now so because gaming said i have a hive i installed this brain they have a deep and three mediums i didn't pull honey from this hive and all the boxes are full should i do a split now or just leave them well i don't know what your season looks like if you watch the video that i did today i also had a link up there and showing you how we made splits you can make stronger splits than that that's just what i'm making right now we have you know, I consider winter weather starting to show up in November. And so I still have a pretty decent amount of time to get a couple rounds of brood. I don't know what your weather's like, um, but it can happen, especially if you make a strong split. It, but you, you can totally do that. Now, as far as the three mediums, if it's a mixture of sugar syrup and honey, obviously you don't, you can, but you can extract that out of those combs if you want them next year to just put honey in them and you can bottle that. You don't sell it. But technically, you can eat it. Um, I mean, goodness, most of us consume stuff that has cane sugar and high fructose corn syrup all the time. This is actually better because it's been handled by the bees. I'm not saying that you should sell it. But you can also use that um, extracted sy syrup slash honey if they have too much. Now, you want to leave plenty for winter. Don't get me wrong. But if you have a fall flow still incoming, you can take some of that, and it's wonderful for mixing into pollen patties, or you can feed it back to the bees if they need it later. You can make queen candy with that stuff. There's a lot of different things you can do with thick syrup slash honey. How does your fall flow compare with the volume-wise with the late spring, early summer flow? Not even close. Spring flow is phenomenally better and more consistent. Fall flow here, we'll have some years where we need to put supers on. They'll even want to swarm if they backfill enough. We'll have some years where they, they just barely get enough. And last year, we, we had about two months uh, without rain, about actually eight or nine. No, it was about nine or ten weeks without rain during the fall, right before the fall flow. And the plants just didn't do as good. A lot of research showing that the amino acids and quantity and quality um, are affected by that quite a bit. So we had to feed a lot last year, record amount. This year, shaping up to not be that way at all. Some years, you can harvest fall honey, like supers of it. And some years you're feeding your bees. Fall flow is very in inconsistent here. Have you ever had ants attacking your hives? Um, you know, only really weak hives in this area. We do have a lot of ants here, but we don't have ants like they do in Florida. And you want to have crazy ants and, and some of the other, you know, there are some fire ants here in Tennessee. Bees that are really healthy seem to defend themselves very well. However, a lot of time they get most of the time when people have issues with ants is because there's places in the hive that the bees can't access and defend it. This usually happens between the inner cover and the telescoping cover. And because there's an area that's too thin for the bees to get into, it's a perfect place for an ant colony. I mean, it's, it's perfect. Roaches and ants, all that stuff. It's, it's, it's everything that they could want. The bees control the temperature. You have wonderful clean uh, aromas coming from below occasionally you might be even able to sneak down there and get a snack but mostly it's it's issues because of that if, but the only time i've lost hives because of ants is when they were super weak incredibly weak yeah how soon after requeening can i start oa treatment Hey, R. Feely, I, I like to wait till I'm seeing some larvae, which usually means, you know, you got three and a half days that they're an egg. And, you know, of course, 
then you'll have a little bitty larvae. But I like to see when they're they're not like first day old. So we're I like to shoot for six or seven days after the queen started laying. Once the queen started laying like that, they really have committed to that queen. I've done oxalic acid vapor seven days after introducing a queen several times. It does really good. Um, now, I wouldn't do anything like thiamol or formic that actually had a strong smell to it. Oxalic acid has virtually no smell and it does not linger. Now, if you smell oxalic acid vapor, let me tell you, it'll choke you up. Thankfully, bees don't breathe the same way we do. So, Raisin Hells was like, um, what's your go-to on small hive beetle protocol? So, I really don't have one, to be honest. Um, I have not hardly done anything for small hive beetles this year. This year's been lower than usual, but I just like having big, strong colonies. That's the number one thing. Um, if I feel like I want to reduce them, there's a lot of different options. I've got a lot of the Dynamax towels that I, I throw in. I have thrown in the past. Um, they'll get stuck in those fibers. That works very well. Unfortunately, occasionally you catch some bees. I have never heard of anybody catching a queen in one of those, but that is a possibility. So always try to keep those to the edge of the brood nest, not in the center, just to play a little more safe. But they work really well. Um, beetle busters um, can help quite a bit. Um, there is a little bit of issue sometimes with the beetle busters getting clogged up occasionally, especially during summer when the bees have nothing better to do. Sometimes they'll clog up all the holes with propolis and you got to manually unplug those. But it does work very well when um, they're open. And then the beetle blasters work very well. The diatomaceous earth, I did a test on that, worked very well. Um, there's a couple other things out there. I really don't, I don't have any experience with the guardian thing. I just don't, I, I know some beekeepers who have used it and said it didn't work that well for them. So I don't know what to think of that one. But, you know, there's a lot of ways to control small hive beetles. Um, it, I think with small hive beetles, if you really want to control them, it's going to be a, a year round thing, especially in certain areas like Florida and the South. Just constantly chipping away at their percentages and keep it that way. And it takes, especially if they built up over years, it could take a couple of years to really get them down because there's some pupating in the soil and you've got that rotation going and you'll never eliminate all of them. But if you're constantly killing them, then I think you, you can significantly impact them, especially during critical times of the year. I think, you know, early getting on them early in the season is, is really important. But that's that's the way it is with any pest. Get get to them early. Get get to them before they're really a problem. ECP said I saw a beekeeper doing an OA without a respirator. Is this recommended? I've done that a few times. If you're really careful, you can do it. It's not recommended at all. It's not safe. Um, but then again, there's a lot of things that I've done in my life that were not safe that my mother would not have appreciated me doing, and I did it anyways. Um, you know, I I was very careful in how I did it. I don't recommend it at all. It's not smart. And also um, the, the pro vaps and some of those that have, you know, that are pressurized, they can blow off the top and actually um, spray stuff on you if it gets plugged. So you, you need to watch that. Eye protection is, is recommended as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, I do. And again, it's not like I'm recommending it, but at the same time, I understand that, you know, people need, should be able to decide for themselves. Um, I, th I think that sometimes it's not always, some people make stupid decisions, but at the same time, I don't like it when I, I do a video and I'm cutting something on my table saw. And just because I'm not using what somebody feels like is safe, I, I consider some things to be safe. Uh, I'm very familiar with the table saw. I don't like being babied. I'm an adult. If I cut my finger off, it's my problem. No, it's no problem, Yuri. Um, um, ah, do you think powdered sugar? That's a uh, That was really popular back when I was getting into beekeeping. It does in increase grooming, and it does aid in a very minute way of mite removal. But then again, it is a very short-lived thing. So if your bees are brooding heavily, you're only getting ex the exposed mite, which in a heavy brooding colony is somewhere around maybe 20% of the mites available for this treatment to work. It's very short-lived. 
you're not going to get a hundred percent kill. We don't know what the percentages are with that. It's been proven to be very ineffective. Can it chip away at the numbers? Yes, but you might delay the mites. If you did one treatment, you might delay a collapse by a week or two. If you did five of them, you might delay it by a month or two. Um, it would, it's so intensive, incredibly intensive, and it's, it's just not very effective, and that's why very few people use it. It was very popular back in the day. There's some commercial operations that you know really tried it out. And I, you know, a lot of people don't like the commercial guys, but there's some really good ones out there, and that they're really hardworking, and they they really try to do their best for what they can do. And if they're not using it, it probably means it's not very effective. Obviously, I mean, these guys are not stupid. They want they wouldn't be running ten and twenty thousand colonies and keeping them alive and and doing pollination. And, and being able to make a living at it and support a lot of other families that work for them if they weren't able to f problem solve and, and run a business. Obviously, Laurel, that was mine. Anyways, um, you know, so I, I really look at these guys a lot and see what they're doing. And not everything translates from over from commercial beekeeping down, but a lot of it does a lot more than what a lot of hobby beekeepers realize. If you're not a hundred percent sure that it's going to give you good results, I, I would be concerned because, and that's where the alcohol wash comes into play because you make a mistake or it's not as effective as they said it was. And then now you're short a $185 nucleus colony. And not only that, you're shelling out that money. You've lost all that honey production for that year. It's a whole nother year. You got to do it. And trust me, I've been on that that whole merry-go-round several, several years. Got tired of it, and we started changing things up and thinking things through and doing the math on the mites and how they reproduce. Brian, you're too much. Really are. I really appreciate you sticking around this late, especially if you got to get up that early. So, buddy, you take it easy. Got any questions, you let me know, okay? Appreciate you. Hey, Bruce. So what we're ta talking about is actually shaking the powdered sugar onto the bees themselves. They really won't eat it dry. You can chuck it in there and they'll toy with it, but they really don't like eating dry cornstarch. Um, I mean, powdered sugar and cornstarch. Most of it, they just, they just chuck it out of the hive. You'll just see a bunch of it. You, they just basically what you do is you dust the bees. It gets all over their hairs. They grim themselves and the, the friction from the powdered sugar is supposed to knock off mites and it does to a small percentage, but this, see, it's the same thing with the powdered sugar shake. Instead of doing the alcohol wash, a lot of people want to do the natural, they don't kill the bees powdered sugar shake that, and how that works. It's not really because a lot of people think the powdered sugar is the right size. So it knocks the mites off, right? No, it's actually the heat that's being built up when you're shaking that. And the heat causes the mite to back out of the bee where it's consuming on them. Those little devils. And then they they fall down and then you can count them. However, it's been proven several times that powdered sugar just is, is not near as effective and as accurate as an alcohol wash. It's not. So if you're relying on powdered sugar for your mite control, it's not going to give you good results either. Um it just doesn't. Uh, we used to try that a lot. I'm, I remember some years dusting the bees like seven or eight times with that. And man, the bees hate that. It, they, they do groom a lot though. Natural cum size didn't work for me either. A lot of people have tried that. Um, I'm not saying it's bad. And I think there's that we need to look more into that. But there's some scientists in, that toyed around with that and they didn't seem like it helped a whole lot. The problem with Varroa is it is such a big problem. It's not something that a little thing can really affect, I don't think. It hasn't proven to be so far. I think it's either going to be something that severely impacts Varroa, like a Apigard treatment or Apivar treatment or something, some treatment like that or, ox, or an oxalic acid treatment at a, a, a good time when the mites are exposed, something that's heavy duty and that's thought out and actually works or it's got to be a combination of something like that along with maybe small cell foundation and actually it's kind of a misnomer that it's it's the natural bee size um, a lot of honeybees are not naturally 4.9 millimeters 
Um, natural size is more around 5.1 to 5.2. And so regressing them down to 4.9 is, is really not natural for most honeybees. If you, if you actually measure them, wild bee combs, they're not really 4.9. They're actually, there's a lot of variables there, quite a bit on sizes. And so the bees really don't care that much. Uh, but the, the problem is with a lot of that information, when people get really into their, this is the way that I beekeep. And, and I think a lot of them get to believing it. What they, they believe their stuff so much that whether it truly works to the rate that they say it does, it doesn't matter. They, they've solely, they bought into it. And some of them, I think they just, they can't be, they can't be wrong. It's, it, it just never enters their mind. And if there's one thing that has helped me with this business and getting to where I am is realizing that the number one issue that I have faced over the years lies here. It was my choice to listen to poor information. It was my choice to do, make the decisions that I made. And once we start realizing that most of the things that affect us negatively come from ourselves and we start changing the way we think, that's usually when positive change is created. That's my personal opinion. Let's see here. Well, which one? So Ron Foltz asked about the spirulina patties. I just did a video on them. Um, we might be testing some without essential oils or very little essential oils in the future. I'm not saying that they're bad the way that they are, but the main reason that I use um, healthy bee uh, or any patty is to beef the bees up, especially when I'm making splits. The bees are still doing well. I think there's too much essential oil in there and there's just all, that's all there is to it. I can be 20 feet away from the highs and still smell those patties and those it's too strong. Um, it's like treating your bees with Apigard thymol product. And whenever you do anything like that, whether it's just essential oils or it's a thymol as a treatment, you are majorly disrupting the colony like 90 something percent or more of all their communication comes through pheromones and you're messing that up. When the brood emerges out of the cells, that it's emitting the pheromones, letting the queen know, hey, there's free, va there's vacancy over here for you to lay in. Young larvae emit certain pheromones at different stages, letting the nurse bees know when they should be fed, at, you know, this at what age. You know, when they're really young, they're, they're fed more royal jelly like the queen. That's why we graft from really young larvae. When they get a little older, they get fed a different diet, but all that's pheromones. And when you're putting something there that you can smell as a human 20 feet away, it's blowing the bees' brains out. Their, their sense of smell is phenomenal. So I'm not, think, I'm not saying that they're bad. They're definitely small, high beetle resistant. There's no question of that. Um, I would just like to see them with less essential oil. But the problem is, it's just like everything else. It's usually a trade-off. We might end up with a patty that's less resistant to small, high beetles, but it ends up being more beneficial to brooding. Yuri says, I'm actually looking forward to the next month when carob tree honey starts coming in. It is dark and tastes like chocolate. No way. If it really is, you need to send me a picture or something. By the way, I'm on Facebook, guys. If you guys do that, I know a lot of people don't like it. I don't blame you. It's a nutty place, but it has its purposes, especially when you're sharing bee information. So I'm on there. If you want to follow me on there, I post some of the stuff that we can't do on YouTube, pictures, um, good sales, pricing on stuff, and that kind of thing. Um, I pretty much only get on Facebook for beekeeping, and that is like it. Um, but I'm on there if you guys want to. And you can occasionally... Um, I see pictures and stuff like that um, when people post on my page. Hey, Dan, no, I haven't had any problems keeping queens alive in the hive this year. Out of the ordinary, there's always some hives that are trouble hives, and they just they won't keep queens. They get out of balance. They get too old. There's a lot of factors that go into the play with that, and they, it doesn't matter. You can throw the world's greatest queen in there. They won't accept her. Um, they're just They get so far gone, and there's just not a whole lot you can do about it. Um, I hate hives like that. You can kind of fix them sometimes, but usually by the time you've added brood from other colonies, you add a queen cell, you wait all that time, you've done all that work, you might as well just made a brand new split, shook those bees out, and give gave those cones to uh, some other colony that deserves it. 
do you believe feral bees are better survivors than packaged or nukes bees? I mean, obviously, um, feral bees, um, I think, are better than packaged bees, but I think everything's better than packaged bees. Um, nuke bees is, is sometimes nu nukes are basically packages. I mean, people, you know, some of them are on YouTube. They just basically buy packages, stick them in a nuke, and sell them. And, um, and sometimes it's not that they stick a package in a nuke and build it up and sell it. Sometimes they make nukes off of their own bees, but they don't know how to raise their own queens or they're making their nukes early and trying to extend their season. And they purchase queens from package producers because it's cheaper and they don't know how to raise their own queens. So you end up with the same quality. Anyways, as far as feral bees goes, they, they are a, there's a, there are can, mixed can of worms. Just because you can survive doesn't mean you're a good bee. They can be stinking aggressive. They can be poor honey producers, extremely swarmy. Um, doesn't mean they're necessarily really resistant to mites as far as being able to do what we would like them to do and survive in a, a hive. Um, bees that sur survive in the wild still have very low survival rates. Even before Varroa had very um, low survival rates, usually about 60 to 80% um, of first year swarms died. And, and that's, that was the study done before Varroa and all these things hit. So I think we need to keep that realistic. And a lot of these bees that are in trees are not feral. They're either mixed with our bees or they're just swarms that I shot some swarms out this year I know of. Um, I'm sure I filled a couple tree hollows full of bees. So if someone cuts those out, they're not going to be feral bees. They're going to be awesome caiman bees. That's what. And um, so, you know, feral bees are a mixed can of worms too. And, and I think a lot of their defensive mechanisms of survival and shedding mites comes from swarming, 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 swarming. So that those kind of genetics are not conducive for a good bee yard at all. You don't want bees that are going to swarm when they're not even too deep strong. You don't want bees that aren't ever going to produce any honey. You don't want bees that are going to nail your socks to your ankles every time you get into them. I don't. I don't like that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so feral bees aren't this, you know, special unicorn that a lot of these treatment-free guys tote. I've caught and I've cut out and I've raised my own queens off of a lot of these things. There's, there's just there's just no mag magic easy solution for anything. Anyone that tells you that it's easy is trying to sell you something, basically. Ronnie says, um, I'm in uh, South Carolina. When should you requeen? That's a great question. And a lot of beekeepers have differences of opinions on this. Some people don't want to kill a queen um, prematurely. And uh, I can definitely see both sides of the argument. From a business standpoint, it makes total sense to requeen before you have issues. But also as a beekeeper, um, I don't like eliminating queens that are still laying good. And so what we do a lot of times is like this time of the year – is if we feel like the queen's getting older, we'll make a split with her. We'll take her out of the production colony. We'll make a nuke. And if she runs that nuke through winter and builds it up to sell bees out of the next year, you know, we won't sell her because she's probably two years old at that point. But if she builds that up and she, you know, builds it back up to a double deep, you know, we have painted marks and stuff. So we, we know how old she is. And she does a good job. We'll we'll set, we'll make a new queen and sell a nuke off of that hive. And so she's still being used, but we're not using her for honey production. You definitely want your best queens for honey production, your young queens and stuff. And so it really just is all in what you want. I like to let a good queen go. And you know, our oldest queen that we ever grafted from was four years old. That's very rare, even for raising our own queens and trying to breed for longevity. Um, however, um, we do try to breed for longevity. I like to see at least two good years out of a queen, but there, there's a balance there as well. So uh, it's, it's personal preference. And up north, queens are going to last longer than in south typically because they're just not going to lay as much in a year, and they they just don't run out as gas uh, out of gas near as fast. Hey, Cayman, what is the minimum night temp? Will you split a hive? It is nearly spring here, and I want to get a head start. Oh, you're on the opposite side of the world. So that's cool. Uh, you know, it really depends on the cluster. Again, I had a video from March of last year where I was splitting and it was dropping down into the low 30s Fahrenheit. And, uh, you know, I think it might may, might have been, I know nights after that, it was getting into the 20s and the upper 20s Fahrenheit. So you can totally do it. 
bees just need a cluster. They, they need young bees. So whenever you make a split, say you have two frames of brood, you want all of the adhering bees on that. And then you want to shake at least two more frames of nurse bees in there. And the best places you're going to find that is on larvae, but you don't want to take too many bees from your strong colony. So make sure, make sure you have good bee coverage that there's more bees on that split than what the brood needs. And also give them a, a little bit of feed if you can. Now, I know in some places um, you don't have as much access to the pollen supplements, but if you have access to bananas, um, that can help a little bit. It's not as good, I don't think, as Ultra B, but just giving them a little bit of feed, giving them some forward progress, don't ever let them feel like they're running low. They'll cannibalize that brood. And if they can just get that first turnaround on that brood, you, you can do it. Don't give them a lot of space and especially a, a space above their heads. Um, try to keep, you know, maybe you can get a wooden board and add a follower to it so they're only heating a very small area. But bees do a really good job, especially if they have plenty of access to sugar syrup or plenty of honey at generating a lot of heat. So as long as you're not, I, I make splits. Well, well, shoot, we sold our nukes this year. And it was abnormally cold. And there were five frame nukes and it was 31 degrees that morning. And so, I mean, you can do it in pretty cold weather. I wouldn't want to be doing it when it's getting down below, you know, in the 20s and colder than that, though. I mostly have a, a Italian, uh, not, not Italians, carnies now. Um, I have some Italian bees, but um, I have a lot of carnies. And, you know, both are good. Um, a lot of it has to do with, you know, I, I raise pretty much all my own queens besides a few that I buy every year and we control what we have. And, and then you can, you can see some big differences on carnies that are commercial carnies and, um, and also commercial Italians compared to what's home homegrown. It's like the difference between green beans um, and tomatoes. When, when you get a, a tomato from the store, if you can even call that, it's totally different than what you grow in the garden. The flavor is not the same. I know some folks that grow locally and they went to hydroponic this year instead of growing tomatoes in the ground. They said it was easier. The, the flavor is not there. It's the same thing with raising your queens. You do not get the same quality and level when you do it yourself. I know it's hard starting out. That's why we have these videos, but whether it's grafting or whether it's using your own cells, once you get to the point where you can kind of control your own queens, it really makes things a lot easier for you. A lot more uniformity and higher chances of success. Um, commercial queens stink. So Ron says the spirulina patties he had hardly had any smell to them. Man, you must have got a an interesting batch of them. Mine were pretty potent. Um, maybe uh, if you got them on that cell, though, they might have been a little older and they might have dried out a little bit. But once the bees start you know, adding a little bit of moisture to them the way that they do, they might start stinking a little bit more. Boy, it's getting to 10 o'clock and we're about need to shut this down, but we just kind of threw this together last minute. I really wasn't, I was thinking about doing one yesterday and I ended up hanging out with my family for my five-year-old, um, nephew's birthday party he can't seem to wrap his mind around the letter k right now so i'm not uncle cayman i'm uncle Taman. and it's funny because his daddy could not wrap his mind around the letter k either when he was a kid he called me a, a name with the t as well it wasn't even close at least at least his son gets Taman. um uncle Taman, and uh then uh, Ethan called me Tita. I don't know where that came from. But anyways, funny things that happened in the family. Had a fun time over there. And they had like a 100-foot water slide that my brother rigged up. We have a lot of fun outdoors around here. And I hadn't done anything like that in a while. Been too busy beekeeping. And, man, I'm a little sore today. <whistles> a little sore today. But had a lot of fun. Um Got to show my nephew that his uncle's still really cool, not just because he has the honey. Let's see. But anyways, guys, I think I'm going to go ahead and hop off here. I'm getting a little beat. Um, we'll do another live chat down the road. Thanks, everybody, for coming on. I wasn't sure if we'd have 
several people show up tonight this last minute, but there actually was a bunch of people on here. A lot of good questions. I hope we've been able to answer some things for you. Hey, Yuri, I was walking around shirtless. Thank you very much. Um, you know, when I, when I swim, I, you know, I don't wear a shirt. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm 32 almost, and you know, I'm only going to look this good for a, a little while. I got to show off in front of Laurel while I can. Eventually, I'm just going to be old and decrepit from all this lifting deep boxes and her telling me to get to work. But I hope you all are doing well wherever you are in, in the world. You know, most of our subscribers are in the United States, 70% of them according to Google algorithms. But it has really been a very humbling experience to get to chat with you guys, to get to learn more about your areas. This educates me a lot. It just uh, it shows me just how little that we really know about the flora and the world around us and the, the, the bee strains and just different things and the different types of honey. Um, Yuri, that, that carob honey, man, if it's really that cool, then you've got you to find a way to get me a picture of that. Tennessee's bees at gmail.com. Make sure you put the S on Tennessee um, because not you'll get somebody else and then they're going to contact me upset again because I have a bunch of my subscribers annoying them. <laughs> um, but thanks everybody. Oh, there's Wade. Wade got that, um, that Kiave honey. He's one of our win giveaway winners. If you tried that out, Wade, what do you think of that weird white honey? Thanks for being on, Lady B. I hope it helps you out. We want nothing more than you all to enjoy beekeeping. It's, it's the best hobby in the world. Have you ever heard of Bee Weaver's Bees? Oh, my goodness. Yes, I have. I've actually ordered some in the past, and I have friends that have. You know, I've, I've heard mixed results. Some people really like them. And um, for my experience is that those are partly Africanized. I don't care if they have some type of resistance. Not that I fully believe in that anyways, but they are the meanest bees I've ever owned. And it'll be a cold day and you know where before I get any bees like that again. They're mean. Hey, Mark, thanks very much. New Zealand, all right. Well, maybe Wade jumped on out of here, but anyways, um, send him that Kiave, honey. I'm hoping in the future to visit my buddy in Hawaii again and do some videos on Hawaiian beekeeping because it is totally weird. And, you know, those bums don't know how good they have it over there. And, Zach, if you're watching this, I'm thinking about you right now. All right, guys, I'm out of here. It's time to get some dinner. Woo! What's for dinner? What? Nothing. It's good in coffee, he says. All right.